Hey folks, it's your host, Anthony Desiato here. This episode of My Comic Shop History is a little bit different. It's actually two episodes. It's a special double-sized installment of My Comic Shop History. Two episodes for the price of one. First up is In Defense of Batman v Superman, where I sit down with Doug Desher, Ralph Puma, and Damian Torres and try to find a little bit of redemption for Batman v Superman. Followed by Other Side of the Table, a one-on-one chat with comic book creator Greg Shegel in which we discuss what it's like to be, literally, on the other side of the table at comic book conventions and comic shop signings, and also what it's like to self-publish your own comic book. And here we go. Dan, cue the music. Welcome to My Comic Shop History. I'm your host, Anthony Desiato. For this episode, we're going to put aside our collecting talk and get into Batman v Superman, a movie that I personally enjoyed uh, and that I felt received an unjustified amount of hate. And in the time since the movie came out, I've heard so many negative things about it from fans, friends, critics, and I just felt like I wanted to have a discussion and perhaps maybe, maybe find a little redemption for this movie. So I've assembled an all-star panel here. Very excited to talk to these guys. Awesome. Right across from me, we have uh, finally returning to the show, Mr. Yes. Doug Desher. How are you, sir? It's great to have you back. It's great to be here. I'm, a, I'm thrilled. I love being on your podcast. Oh, we love having you. Your season one favorite. Oh, look at that. I didn't know. And then to my right, it's taken a season and a half. A season and a half, but you're finally here. Ralph Puma. Hey. I want to take this opportunity to thank you in person and on the show. Uh, for anyone who listened to season one, the, all the music that you heard at the beginning and the end of every episode was Ralph and his assorted bands through the years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, thank you very, very much for my, my bringing My publicist that. would like to say that it's only Remember Venice. It's only ever been Remember Venice. <laughs> all right. I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That out. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm just being a dick. And then across from Ralph, we have a new voice to the show, uh, someone I've gotten to know through Spider's Web. I'm very excited to have you here, Mr. Damian Torres. Hi, guys. It's nice to be here. All right. So um, by way of prep, I sent everyone an email that was composed by our mutual friend and previous episode guest, Mike San Gregorio. He sent it to some of us within the AR group uh, after the movie, and it's a rather lengthy comprehensive list of all the things he liked and didn't like so mike's not with us for this episode but but in a way he kind of is and i think we'll be kind of referring to that list every now and then just to kind of have some jumping off points but to start i mean i shared what my thoughts were about the movie and i really wanted to get in get into specifically what you liked and what you didn't like but just to kick it off if you could each just tell me what your you know thumbs up thumbs down somewhere in between what was your reaction to the movie thumbs down a hard thumbs down. Well, it does have redeeming qualities, but overall, it just it's a disjointed mess. Okay. That's my that's my opinion. Ralph, um, thumbs down. I've been trying to find the way to play devil's advocate with it, but my personal thing with it is that it could have been what all DC films should be, and it's be true to the characters, but they want to do this other take which completely destroys, you know, I don't know. I'm, you can cut that out. No, 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 that's... Getting warmed up here. <laughs> and Damien? Uh, for me, it's one thumb up, one thumb down. Um, the thumbs up part, like, the stuff that worked, I thought really worked well, but there was just a lot of things that detracted from that. And um, it, it's very clear that throughout the movie there wasn't, a concise, thorough direction throughout the entire thing. Um, having said that, I didn't like the stuff I disliked. I didn't hate it as much as most people did. Um, and I agree with Anthony in this case, where I felt a lot of the the negativity towards it was unjustified. But I understand where a lot of people were coming from with it because they, there were things that me being a fan myself, I did take issue with. Yeah, 
you know, and that's definitely something I want to touch on as well is the, you know, the, not just our reactions to it, but this response generally, because it, it just, it really struck me how much people seemed to enjoy piling on this movie. Now, I know, you know, Suicide Squad just came out as of this recording, and there's a fan petition to, like, take down Rotten Tomatoes because they feel it's biased against DC films. I am not in that camp. I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> but, again, the response was very striking to me. Uh, I mean, the Batman v Superman score is, like, within one percentage point of Green Lantern. Yeah. I mean, I, that doesn't seem no, right to me. No, that's not right, no. And, Ralph, we saw Green Lantern together. <laughs> Do you feel like they're on par? No, I actually think Green Lantern's way worse. I thought you were going to say better. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Uh, yeah, Green Lantern's a movie I've pretty much forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Ryan Reynolds hasn't. I've just seen Deadpool. It's like, he's clearly okay, everybody. Just want to let you know, I haven't forgotten I was Green Lantern. Yeah. yeah. But I would say that I think Suicide Squad is worse than Green Lantern. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. That's saying something. I know. <laughs> Anthony, why... <laughs> You liked Batman v Superman. What was the thing that made you like it? Well, before I answer that, let okay. me say, um, while I did enjoy it overall, th that's not to say that there were things I didn't like. Um, you know, there were a number of things, and we can get into this, that I think could have been done better or differently. Probably my biggest complaint was just how much they, they crammed into it. Mm -hmm. You know, this was their attempt to short-circuit the, you know, universe-building process that we've seen Marvel do over many movies. So there was so much that they crammed in. I mean, the fact... Oh, I guess we should say this, too. I mean, spoilers. So, I mean, we're going to be discussing specific plot points. Yeah, yeah hit movie. stop now if you haven't seen it and you I, don't yeah. want it spoiled. I imagine most people have by this point. Uh, you know, it was out in theaters and now it's out on Blu-ray and digital and all that. The extended cut is out. Um, but I felt, yeah, they, they tried to cram so much into it. The fact that they went as far as Doomsday and the death of Superman to me really felt like a misstep um but as far as what i did like i mean i i bought into the conflict between batman and superman it worked for me uh going from you know seeing him feeling powerless as a child during the origin scene uh and then cutting to him as an adult and once again being powerless while the city's being destroyed you know it just worked um and i do want to talk and in general i did like the depiction of batman uh and oh, I, I love that as did i yeah and yeah. i mean doug you're one of the probably the biggest Batman fan I know. So right. maybe we actually could kind of start with, with the Batman of it all. Um, we could do that. Batman seemed to receive maybe less hate than, <laughs> than other aspects of the movie. But what was, what was your take on it? Uh, I had one qu quibble that Mike San Gregorio brought up, and it's a good one. Because the whole thing with Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns is that the book opens up and, you know, Bruce is an alcoholic. Why is he an alcoholic? Because he can't be Batman. So he's trying to deal with that. That's a coping mechanism. I found that odd in the Batman v Superman. We see a scene with him waking up in the morning with some hot chick and he's drinking wine out of the bottle from last night. So we kind of don't... That was one thing. And the other, the really big quibble, and the only two things I really didn't like was how much he used guns in the film. At, yeah. And I know it was a dream sequence or something, but, you know... If we, if anybody's seen Batman Beyond, when Bruce gets locked up and they kept talking to him and saying, Bruce, Bruce, and, you know, Terry says, well, why didn't you answer? He goes, that's not what I call myself. He calls himself Batman. So if that is true, then wouldn't Batman, if Bruce is dreaming about being Batman, he wouldn't dream of guns. So I found that was a, a little odd. And I didn't understand who all these super, these men with the Superman patches. But overall, I will say this. I'm not, I was terrified, more terrified than when they announced Michael Keaton was going to be Batman. That Ben Affleck, I'm like, Daredevil was a huge miss. And he, he and George Clooney, they both admit they weren't great. Yeah, Go ahead, you look like you need to say no, something. No, because I, I realized this in, in prepping for this episode, uh, and I guess maybe a disclaimer, maybe I am a little bit of a Ben Affleck apologist, because like, I like the guy. Like, you no, know, I like the guy, and and he's liked, very talented. And I liked Daredevil. I did too, but it, it, <laughs> by the way, he, he, it was a good film. It just it had so many flaws that it couldn't get out of its own way. I don't think it's necessarily him, but he was Daredevil, and you kind of if you're the lead guy, yeah. you kind of take the fall for better for worse. I mean, George Clooney. Is it really George Clooney's fault that the Batman movie he was in sucked? No. Was he a good Batman? No. He was a great Bruce Wayne, but the film had bigger problems than the fact that he wasn't a great Batman. So going back to Batman v Superman, I thought that uh, 
you know, Ben Affleck's portrayal of the Dark Knight was spot on. I really felt that he got it pretty much note perfect. And to that end, I also want to say Jeremy Irons, underappreciated. Mm. What a great Alfred. I yes. mean, he really just nailed it. The Probably <clears throat> the most empowered Alfred we've ever seen. And Michael Caine is the heart of those Christopher Nolan Batman movies. Those movies work because there's so much humanity that comes from Michael Caine that he infuses it with something that people can actually relate to. Jeremy Irons is the badass that we always kind of suspected that Alfred could be if given the chance. And he really does help every step of the way. Whatever Bruce needs help, he's right there. And he really can do almost everything except the fighting. So my favorite parts of this movie were the Batman parts. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, the Batman stuff in this was perfect, I would say. Like, I would take back anything if they was just the Batman parts, but <laughs> it isn't. We have these other elements that we will get into. But what I loved... Oh, the thing about Batman that Zack Snyder brought up, and he just showed, like, one panel either on Twitter or in, like, a thing, and it's Batman in the Dark Knight, Frank Miller's Dark Knight, and... She goes, why are you shooting them? Or I forget the line. And he goes, they're rubber, probably. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> is now Zack Snyder took that and was like, so this is proof that Batman's a killer or is that like a joke from Batman? What is that in the book? You know, that right. Zack Snyder pulled from and is like, well, this is who I think Batman is. You know? Well, I also think that in The Dark Knight Returns, Gotham has gotten so third world bad mm -hmm. i mean it's horrible it's a horrible it's yeah. worse than it was ever depicted and i don't think the gotham metropolis that we see in b versus s and then funny it's bs um <laughs> that the um <laughs> that gotham isn't nearly that bad so why would bat i think batman used bullets in the dark knight returns because things are that bad it's like it's almost anarchic mm -hmm. you know anarchy reigns so batman's doing what i mean let's not forget he almost kills the Joker, and it's only the Joker that finishes the job. Yeah. So th that's a different kind of Batman. I don't. I don't think that's a the Batman that we're seeing in Ben Affleck. So I felt the guns was a very odd choice. You know, for that's the one thing we love about that character. That early on, Batman. You know, in Batman Year One, and then you know Year Two, we find out why he used a gun and that he'll never use it. Why he's never going to use it again, and that's a big part of the mythos now. And that's a new part, but it's a really, really important character what? Uh, ca character flaw yeah. for the portrayal of that Batman. The arc for Batman in this is something that I really enjoyed. You go from the Frank Miller's Dark Knight to the Batman that we all know. Right. And I loved that aspect of it, and it was because of Superman. Mm -hmm. Right. So that theme in and of itself, I loved everything else yeah. <laughs> I just everything else I, and I think that carried across better with the ultimate cut um, you didn't really get that at all with the original theatrical cut Superman was barely in that movie um, and like you guys were saying I also thought Batman was the best part uh, Batman is my personal favorite character and I just think the scenes with him and Alfred interacting were probably my favorite scenes and it makes me excited for what a solo movie could be um, because as you were saying, Doug, uh, this is the first time we get to see an, uh, an Alfred that's very interactive and engaged with Batman in this whole process. Uh, something that we see in the comics all the time, but we never necessarily got with the films. Um, Michael Caine was a bit more than, like, say, uh, I forgot, my, Guff from the original Batman films? Right. I think uh, that's who it is. Yeah. So, something we didn't get from that Alfred where he was just a butler. Well, he was also um, foppish. Yeah. You know, that's they didn't yeah. empower him as a character. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Ben Affleck's portrayal I thought was amazing. Um, the nightmare sequence, like in that kind of universe, I get why he's killing people w with the way everything is so tyrannical and destitute and just destroyed and everything. But I just think the nightmare sequences in general weren't needed. I agree 100%. I mean, like I said, probably my biggest issue with the movie was how overstuffed it was and uh, the nightmare sequences in particular. So I watched the extended cut uh, mm -hmm. just a few nights ago, and I enjoy for anyone who was so was like kind of lukewarm on the movie, I think this might turn you around. If you hated the original, I don't think this would convert right. you. Um, but I liked it, and it's funny because there aren't really 
long scenes or sequences ahead. Mm-hmm. It's like a little bit here and there, but it just kind of makes everything flow a little bit better. Certain plot points are, are clearer. Um, but, uh, but anyway, going back to the nightmare stuff, that I really felt needed to go. Yeah, because there's no context for it either. No. Like, why is Batman of all characters getting these type of scenes? Um, if it was Wonder Woman, perhaps, maybe that makes sense. Yeah. Because, you know, her culture and whatnot and where she comes from. But I just didn't think it was necessary. I, I think uh, the Just League, I get why they need to put these scenes in it for the whole universe. But I didn't think any of it was really necessary. They could have done the whole story, uh, the main story of the film. Um, and, like, the scenes that were cut, that were added for the uh, ultimate cut... There was so much context in those scenes, especially Superman's uh, motivations and his investigations throughout the film. Yes. Um, and I, I just think, like, there are scenes that were in the original cut that could have been removed and still would have kept the same runtime if they kept those scenes that they cut out to begin with. I agree. Yeah, the extended yeah. cut had a lot more connective tissue, and you just hit on it. Probably my favorite aspect of the extended cut, you get a lot more of Clark the reporter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a great scene where he interviews... Um, the well, they weren't married, but the the baby mama of one of Batman's victims, one of the guys that he branded, who then gets killed in prison. Mm-hmm. And Clark talks to this woman, and basically the gist of it is, she says like, you know, the Batman like he only responds to a fist. And then Clark's next step is confronting Batman as Superman. But it's like you have that scene, and it's like it just tracked a little bit better. So um, you know, again, especially in that sense, I thought the extended cut worked a lot mm-hmm. better. Uh, I have a theory about why all the DC films are not up to par, except for the Christopher Nolan trilogy. I think that Superman Returns, if that had been a successful Superman movie, I think the relaunch needed to have Superman first be successfully launched. Now they're playing catch-up, and they're introducing Superman, and now Batman's already been around, which I don't think works. And I think that because Christopher Nolan's Batman was so successful, they don't know how to introduce Superman, and they're trying to figure that out. One of the things that really bothered me is I've always loved Superman and Batman are light and dark, yin and yang. And the entire film, you know, San Gregorio's email is like, is it, does the sun ever come out in this movie? <laughs> the thing that really, really bothers me is you don't get a juxtaposition between Bruce and Clark and Batman and Superman, they're both dark. Mm -hmm. And they're the same character, almost. Like, Superman's never happy. He's always brooding and I'm like no unless that's he's in a hot tub with Lois <laughs> well, I didn't like the bathtub scene I thought that really? was I, I thought it was unnecessary yeah, it did, didn't I, I do agree. anything for the plot I didn't it wasn't a bad scene it was well acted but it doesn't contribute you know these films if you look at let's just take the dark knight with uh, Heath Ledger go through that script and watch the film there's no fat in that film every bit of the dialogue and every shot is necessary for the advancement of that film it doesn't let up Mm -hmm. this film i felt they made a lot of bad choices like oh so now doomsday is from the dna of zod oh we're we're destroying smallville oh we're it's just metropolis is across the lake from gotham i mean just lex luther is an insecure douchebag i mean just there were so many bad choices that didn't need to happen like with that said i thought the batmobile chase was one of the greatest chase scenes i've ever seen so why is it when we have two characters and when one character's on screen it's a great film and when the other one shows up you just go No, I mean, your your point is well taken, and, and I agree. I do think that is a problem with the movie, where you do have these two characters, but you don't have the contrast that you really need. Um, one of the reasons why I like the bathtub scene is that it, it shows Clark, like, he has some personality, just as he does at the Daily Planet and, you know, in his investigation and all that. I guess a problem I had was he has all this personality as Clark. Like, he gets in Bruce Wayne's face at the, at the party. You know, like, I, I love that. And then as Superman, it's like he barely speaks. Yeah. You know, so that was definitely, you know, uh, an issue that that I had. I've got two things to add to Doug's. And one is what does Warner slash DC want us to think? Has the whole world been established or are they establishing the world? You know, is Batman having these visions because he's already been back in time into the cave and like is has he had all of that? We don't know that the audience doesn't know that Um, or has this been a new Batman and now he's getting these visions because we don't know, 
You know, yeah. like, so what is, what is established, what isn't established? Same issue with the new 52. <laughs> it's like they're having the same issues in both of their markets. And the other is that it came so close to those moments, but they just never did it. When Flash showed up, I didn't care. But if Flash showed up and he dissolved right in front of Batman, that would have been awesome. But did he show up? Was that a dream? Yeah, exactly. I don't know what that was. Yeah. I, I was yeah. like, is he... Is he hallucinating? Is he dreaming? Is this really happening? Because it happens, and then he wakes up. Yeah. If you weren't a comic book reader, would you even have known that was the Flash? No, you would not know no. it's the no. Flash. And the other thing, like even Doomsday, they didn't. It wasn't even the full look for Doomsday. They didn't like. They showed that he was going to evolve into Doomsday, but it wasn't. If it was the three of them fighting Doomsday instead of that Ninja Turtle, it would have been great. <laughs> or <laughs> but, Clayface, whatever yeah. it was. <laughs> but like, at, like all of these moments were just just short. Yeah. Like, they were just short of the moments. Like, I would have loved it if it was the mess that it was, and they delivered on those moments. Like, once again, Flash dissolving. Oh, my God, they're alluding to Infinite Crisis. Mm -hmm. So, like, the world is established, but they're not going to those moments. They're just... Right Did you feel it. that the introduction of Aquaman and the Flash and all the other stuff, kind of Wonder Woman going through all those files, that felt shoehorned. Mm -hmm. That almost felt like they finished the film, and it was like, oh, <laughs> crap! <laughs> Oh, we have, we have to tell everybody about all these characters that are going to be in the Justice League. What, what, what do we do? One scene, Zack Snyder's like, I know what we'll do. We'll have Wonder <laughs> Woman look at it on the files that Bruce stole, and that's how we'll explain it. Well, they didn't need that. Just like in, like in Suicide Squad, they didn't need the amount of characters they had. I think they have like nine, ten characters. And you don't need that. If it's smaller, works better. Yes. Deadpool is a very good example of exactly. that. Exactly. I didn't mind the hints of the other justice leaguers i don't think it was absolutely necessary but if they felt that it was necessary i felt like that was the maybe the best way to do it it was the least intrusive i mean i know you said it felt shoehorn but it was efficient if nothing else i mean she's sitting there she's going through i mean they got through it relatively quickly and you just got these little glimpses i mean all things considered that i was okay with there's a a thread running through the film that i don't understand and i'm going to ask the three of you this now, I had not seen The Man of Steel before I watched Batman vs. Superman. Really? Yeah, I hadn't. I didn't, I didn't care. I read so much bad about it, I didn't care. So I'm watching Batman v. Superman, and they keep referring to this thing in the desert. And I'm like, oh, now i got to go watch Man of Steel because the thing in the desert probably happened. And it... Uh, did any of you understand the whole... Th incident in the desert because they never really explain what it even was who was even there and why it's important david goyer just wanted to shoot jimmy olsen in the head <laughs> <laughs> i will admit in the watching it in the theater i was a little bit lost the extended cut does a better job though of, mm -hmm. of kind of setting it up um so lois was going to interview this terrorist and um the CIA was using it as an opportunity to try to take so this, this person out. So this is in the extended cut, but it's not in the regular cut. So it actually it makes sense in the ultimate cut. It makes yes? more sense yeah. in the. I think they, there's like enough for you to piece it together in the theatrical, but yeah, it, but yeah, it's, 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 it's just it's, bits and pieces. Yeah. In the theatrical. Well, whereas it, when that kind of thing happens in a Marvel film, they explain it. And they do it very succinctly, and you know what's going on. They, they explain it, they do it succinctly, and then we move on and we're back to plot. Right. And this I didn't get. And it's funny you say that it makes more sense in the ultimate cut, because that's what I felt about the Daredevil film that Ben Affleck was in. <laughs> so two movies that yeah. <laughs> are better in an extended cut that he's been in, because I felt <laughs> the extended cut of Daredevil was a very decent film. Yeah. Whereas the abbreviated version was pretty disjointed and unenjoyable. Yeah, but yeah, so that like that desert sequence in particular, they I mean Jimmy Olsen gets named in the extended cut, which yeah. you didn't get in the theatrical. Right. You know, you see mm. it in the credits, and I was like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so you know that that definitely tracked better. I felt like you know you mentioned Lex earlier. Uh, Lex is another area where while I enjoyed the film, again there are aspects that that weren't my favorite. What he, was your he, least favorite Lex scene? The red capes are coming. Yes, the red capes are coming. <laughs> yeah. My le my least favorite was when he was when everybody's at his uh, his yeah. soiree and he's like uh, 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 and he starts like having a meltdown. Yeah. I'm like this guy's like all powerful businessman who like decimates people and he's got like personality twigs of uh, tw like weird ticks and 
twitches. And I'm like, this is not Lex Luthor. This is not how I would portray this character. I mean, look, I've mentioned this on the show many times. I loved Smallville. Michael Rosenbaum is probably my favorite depiction of mm -hmm. Lex Luthor. But as I was watching the extended cut, I was thinking, I mean, do you think they went with, with Eisenberg and with this portrayal to have more of a contrast from, from Clark and Bruce? Because if you have someone else who's, who's more imposing and put together, it might feel like three, you know, three of the same. That's a good point. But then shouldn't Lex be more like he could be like that behind the scenes and projecting and then we 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 never know if he's going to come completely unglued but he should always just barely hold it together in front of people i felt that was a weakness that alex luther would not exhibit in front of a group of people he doesn't really know because you know and by the way another lex luther thing i didn't understand did nobody notice he wasn't sitting in his vip seat when the capitol hearing begins and the guy in the wheel keith in the wheelchair is gonna blow everything up speaking of that and yeah. I, I don't mean to that's gonna, but no, it's, it's on that note though yeah. um i know another criticism people had in the theatrical cut um you know why didn't superman know that that mm -hmm. the bomb was going to go off the extended cut explains that it was lead lined well, that, yeah. I, I kind of assumed that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, but just another piece of strange. like... Right. right. The general public is not going to get that. Yeah. And and it sucked having to explain that constantly to people yeah. over and over again. And like, in the ultimate cut, it was there. Like, uh, it was Lois Lane who figures it out. Lois Lane and um, that other woman she was working with behind the scenes. And and, and another thing, too, with that scene, um, you actually get to see Superman, like, save people and convey the aftermath of everything yes. blowing up. Yes, yes which was totally missing from the original cut and it made Superman seem cold and heartless. Yes, it yeah, did. He just one. stands there and flies yeah. away. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. But, but yeah, you get to see him help with the... Re I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, that was a really nice mm -hmm. addition. Uh, Lex stuff for me, I think it is a natural progression for that character to be that way. You know, you had the real estate mogul, then you have like the enemy, like the big corporate capitalist, and now you have the Silicon Valley guy. You know, it's all different versions of like what is evil and what people like represent as like what's evil. And this person who can control your information and have these social networks, that's what's viewed as evil now. But his delivery on that was what was yeah. lacking. I think that that interpretation of Lex is fantastic. I think that is the natural, like if, you know, you were to write Lex now and create the character right now, that's who he would be. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I just think he was played too eccentrically. Mm hmm. Um, yep. The other day, we actually had the social network playing on here. And I remembered when Eisenberg was cast, I know a lot of people gave him crap for it, but I thought of how his portrayal of Mark Zuckerberg was in the social network. Whether it's accurate or not, he was very cold and calculating. Mm -hmm. And when I, when, I, when I heard he was cast, I was like, okay, that makes sense, because that's how I see Lex. Yep. And we didn't get that at all. He, no. he came across, a lot of people say it, like very Riddler-esque. And yeah. if he was Riddler, I could understand that. I think he would but, have been a good Riddler. Yeah, I think so too. But as a Lex Luthor, not so much. Yeah. But that's the thing with this movie. I think they allowed for no explanation to the audience to allow the actors, the writers, the directors to put their intent on. But because it's such a fan-loved thing, what is their intent? We don't know. You know, did Jesse Eisenberg not want to play his social network character again, so he went to the other extreme? Did David Goyer not want to do... Dark Knight and Superman Returns again, so we made something different. We don't know what their intent is behind these films and what all of that is. So it's just very difficult to know if it's good or not from where fans. We're all fans here, you know? We're not. But, you know, good storytelling is good storytelling. And, you know, even. S I didn't know what to expect with Deadpool. Mm -hmm. I had no expectation. I just said, please tell me a good story and, and let it be fun. And it was way better than I expected. And I didn't have high hopes for Batman versus Superman. I just didn't. And it was worse than I thought it was going to be. And that's the thing I think my biggest problem is, is that when it got close to being great, like, I love Gal Gadot. Yeah. I think she's Who phenomenal. Doesn't? <laughs> no, but I mean, as an actress, she was, I was like, I don't know who you could cast as Wonder Woman. And I was like, well, now I do. That's who you cast. Mm -hmm. She's phenomenal. And I felt she was underused. Yep. And I, I felt like they kind of, I think you alluded to it, they took too much stuff. It's like 30 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. Mm -hmm. And they just crammed too much into it. It reminded me of uh, the second Batman Returns when it's like, we don't need to 
villains or what was it super uh spider-man 3 yeah, yeah. oh yeah that's yeah. a yeah. great Where example like, <laughs> of way too many villains Wait, exactly so you know i think it would have been better you know and also the thing that really irks me about this film is clark and superman never get a chance to endear themselves to you mm -hmm. because he, he's just oh he's from another planet and he needs to be eradicated it almost felt like xenophobia yeah you know that was another criticism of of the, the Batman depiction and uh, so I kind of had that in mind when I was watching the extended cut uh, and in particular there's you know when Clark and Bruce have their um, you know face off at the at the party and Bruce talks to Clark about how the, the planet is always printing stories about that alien and though it's the way he says alien it's just dripping with so much hate but uh, again keeping in mind that uh, we have a little live music here uh, <laughs> keeping in mind that you know this is a Batman you know so much further down the line and he even says to Alfred it's like you know how many how many good guys are left in Gotham like how many stayed that way like he's seen so much and then I feel like by having him be so extreme you do as Ralph you pointed out earlier you do get that arc for him where he get you know gets to the end and it's mm -hmm. I'm a friend of your sons and all that so uh, I mean his his arc in particular you know tracked well for me and I do think the fact that he is such an older Batman does account for a lot the gun stuff, the nightmare stuff, that I think is yeah. still a tough hurdle to overcome. But a lot of the rest of it, like the drinking, the woman in his bed, I know that was something that I, Mike had on his list, like that, oh, why have a woman in his bed? It's like, why wouldn't he have a woman in his bed? <laughs> Whether it's now or 20 years from now, I really feel, you're a big Batman fan, tell me what you think, well, you, you guys all are, but I feel like the Playboy persona, you know, that's not his true self, but it's like he, he likes it. He likes, to some extent, he likes it. And he's not... You know, he, he he's not abstinent. Yeah. Nowhere right, in the yeah, mythos is Bruce Wayne yeah. abstinent. <laughs> and you just reminded me of something. I, I maybe the least favorite thing that happened in the movie, the Martha thing. Yeah. All right. I that knew this was, was gonna. Yeah. That was so <laughs> awkward and uncomfortable and unnecessary. And it, it it's it smells of bad plot advancement. Well, once again, I think even like how Gal Gadot was handled, all of the women in this movie. As you know, you have the damsel in distress. You have the not talking hot assassin thing. You have the motherly figures. That's all the women were in this film. You know, you had the senator, but all her scenes were cut out, apparently, from what I've heard from the ultimate cut. Like, she had a lot more scenes in the ultimate cut. And you had, like, the other characters that we're all women that were also cut out. You just reminded me of something. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna approve. You're bringing the kryptonite over, but <laughs> but the guy who's her assistant or her cohort, he gives him everything. Yeah. I know. What is he? The president of the United <laughs> States? It's like, is there is none of this stuff classified? I mean, Hillary Clinton, the FBI investigated her for emails, but this guy's like giving Lex complete carte blanche and just cart all this Kryptonian stuff. Out of a military, into, uh, just take it. Yeah, he yeah, can't sure. get him a clearance for the shipment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I didn't really think about that until you said it. But it's like, yeah, it's, I know. It makes absolutely you no sense. You want the bot? No problem. Take the yeah. bot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anything else you want? Because you know, if you got a Christmas list, I'm willing to make yeah. all your Christmas dreams come true. My two biggest issues were the Martha and Lois. I think Lois was handled so poorly in this film. I think she was weak. I think that she, they just kind of knew they had to use her in this so they just made her the damsel in the stress and a plot point to just ruin superman's day I, yeah i think a, a great example of not knowing what to do with her and one of my biggest complaints about the movie is the whole disposal and then retrieval yeah. of the spear yes <laughs> what's that it's like wh like why are you and you know again with the again the extended cut had so much great stuff like cut out throwing the spear away mm. and trying to get it back almost drowning it's like they waste all this time thank you on the spear it's like you could have had yeah. some of those other scenes in there and still kept mm. the runtime. and do you know why that scene is is stupid and ridiculous and bad for the film it makes lois look dumb yeah, yeah. and she's one of the mm. best reporters on the planet she is the I, right they, they, yeah, well, they always I, depict her as she's a strong woman in a man's game mm -hmm. and she's just as smart and maybe smarter than all the other male reporters and then she takes something that she knows can decimate the man she loves yeah and 
put it somewhere where somebody else can find it and use against him instead of taking it and saying, we got to keep this from somebody getting it and using it against you. Now, a smart Lois Lane would know that. Exactly. Right. My writer's brain was like going the whole time with this movie. Like, oh, I would have done this instead or I would have fixed this or I would have done that. But like something with Lois, like there was a glimmer in that first scene when she's being held captive and she just kind of like looks at Clark. I was hoping it would be like this dual fight scene between them. And then Lois would then reveal that the CIA were doing fucked up shit that and all of it would be out there but once again right after that scene Lois was nothing <laughs> like, and I also wanted to see her when Perry says you need to drop this Lois I wanted to see her not drop it and expose some stuff and and you know make this an interesting film mm -hmm. we've got some real reporting going on that's showing that the government is is what you need to be worried about not superman superman's yeah. not your worry you should be worried about the government and i love that when alfred says he's not the enemy yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. he really stood up to bruce i was like whoa yeah. like there wasn't even a lois like don't you know who i am to perry <laughs> like <laughs> just little things like that and another thing and i don't want to do any more writer stuff i won't do any alternate versions of what i have in my head anymore but couldn't have zod just been bizarro <laughs> Yeah. If you wanted to have like Zod transforming, you have another Kryptonian. That's the antithesis right. of what your theme is all about. <laughs> like Superman is evil. <laughs> Speaking of that, wouldn't Kryptonian technology be more sophisticated than Lex Luthor? Okay, access approved. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what is that? Yeah, I know. He goes in. It's like, would you like command of the ship? Yes, I would. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd known it was that easy. <laughs> yeah. So. You, you know, you guys brought up the Martha of it all. So I came out of my first viewing at the theater kind of split on it. Because on the one hand, I was like, there's beauty in the simplicity of it. But on the other hand, I'm like, you know, Bruce is so vicious. I mean, he's like ready to go for the kill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's such a quick turn. And again, he, then he's rescuing Martha. It's like, I'm a friend of your son's. It's like, it's... <laughs> I know I could tell by the cape. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. You know, so I was really split on it. But after watching it again... Like, it, it worked for me. I felt like it made good use of this odd coincidence of them both having the same, the mothers both having the same name. Oh, you liked that? I liked it. I, I thought it justified yet another depiction of Batman's origin. Because mm -hmm. the movie starts, and I, I saw the movie at Alamo, Draft yeah, House. They okay. always have their pre-show reel. And they had a thing of, like, all the other times that the <laughs> origin has been shown. Yeah. And you're watching it, it's like, Jesus Christ. It's like, how many times do we need to watch his parents get shot? Yeah. And that's the you know the first thing in, in this new movie, but I felt like that kind of justified it because at least you have you know the the Martha you know calling out her name and then obviously visiting the grave and I don't know it just the fact that that was what allowed Bruce to see the humanity in Superman I don't know it just worked for me I feel like if there was I mean what would you guys have wanted to be the turning point for Batman like what would the better alternative have been? Um. Well, before I get into that, I just want to throw my two cents in that scene, too. Sure. Uh, I saw the Martha thing as a juxtaposition to the opening. We see his mom get killed. It cut to the scene where the buildings are getting destroyed. He's rescuing this little girl. Her mom is killed, right? You get to this point, and not only do you see Superman is, uh, he sees Superman's humanity there, um, but now he has an opportunity to actually save somebody else's mother, something he can do for himself. He, where he was helpless in both these situations, and now he can actually do something about it. I do think it was contrived, and I, I do think it could have been worded or, or worked around better. Um, and another thing, too, was when, when that fight begins, Superman refers to Batman as Bruce. He doesn't refer to him as Batman. That bothered yeah, me. Yeah, that bothered so, me. And Lex know. knowing Clark's name yeah. bothered me a lot as well. But, but it also showed, at least in the original cut, that let me get the hint that Clark was investigating and he was looking into Batman. In the director's cut, uh, you see that. You see that he's trying to figure out who Batman is and him coming to approach Batman that way showed that he was trying to offer a friendly side to him. Um, it's not clear. Uh, a lot of this is like just me making my own assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I see what they were trying to do there. It just could have been executed better. Yeah. Well, I, I'm so glad you brought that up about... Um you know about about Bruce and Martha and you know the powerlessness you know and all of that because the scene where or the moment where Bruce says to Clark you know I make you a promise Martha doesn't die tonight I, I got a little choked up because it's like here's his moment for you know of redemption like he's you know he can save a Martha right you know which is why Superman would have said Martha to begin with because he knows who Bruce is so rather than saying my mom is caught 
it's not gonna make him like think like just stop in, in his actions right there. You just say the name Martha is gonna trigger something. But yeah. that's not explicitly spelled yeah, out. Yeah, it's not. That's not, but that's very interesting. Yeah, that's actually, really that's, I like that. I like that a lot. All of a sudden, now that scene doesn't bother me nearly <laughs> as much. But you're right. I don't think it was executed properly. I think it could have been handled in a better way. And maybe the way to get humanity into this for Superman is that Batman needs to be saved. And Superman saves him. And all of a sudden, he sees he's an ally, not an enemy. Yeah. But... We never really get to know Superman as the, the the populace in the first in the Man of Steel and in this movie. There's never a time where people get a chance to make a decision. It's like he destroyed so much in the Man of Steel, <laughs> yeah. which was a I thought a very bad choice because the first hour of that film is phenomenal. Yeah, I thought it really was note perfect. That's mm. Krypton. I've yes. seen. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. But the thing that's the problem is Superman is a savior, and he was so quick to blow crap up, to do whatever he had to do. It's like, no, Superman would never engage Zod in Smallville. He would fly, make he would make them chase him. He wouldn't destroy so much. I mean, it was wanton destruction. I mean, it was almost like, we have to blow shit up, don't we? Yeah, okay, let's... Start blowing stuff up. And I think that's the problem. You never get a chance to see Superman choosing life over death and saving versus killing. And I don't think the population ever really gets to know who he is. It's almost like a rush to judgment. Right. And then he dies. I, right. <laughs> I'm a little obsessed with David Goyer. And not in like a good, not way, in a good way, but like in the what is wrong with this man? I need to find <laughs> out everything getting, about him. Why does he keep getting, to write, he keep getting to write all these movies? So I've listened to a lot of things about him talking and... He's playing the long game with these films. He really wants to create the world as it is, like in the comics right now, but he's doing it in a long form version, which is not good for people who want to see those versions. So Superman in Man of Steel has only been Superman for a week. Yeah, right. So David Goyer's thing was Superman to become that person has to make mistakes. And so now after we get the rebirth of Superman, David Goyer wants that to be the real Superman. Okay. Um, but we don't get that. You know, it's, I, I, you, you, the audience is not going to get that. I think David Goyer is wrong. Long game is Marvel's able to do it. Mm -hmm. They're able to introduce Tony Stark in the first Iron Man film, and they got it right. Yeah. It, 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 Captain America, they got it right. The Avengers, maybe one of the best comic book films of all time, they got it right. So long, and they're playing the long game they yeah. have like a 10-year plot they they know what they're going to do 10 years from now mm -hmm. and they've taken their time and every one of these films stands alone and you don't have to see the other ones to enjoy one as a solo right. film i don't think he's doing that yeah but he's trying to going from like before so like how do you make superman he's going into all of these hows and whys which writers are supposed to do but People don't want to see the long form game. They don't want to see how he. They want to see Superman. They don't want to see how he becomes Superman. They don't want to see him making mistakes. We need, especially right now, that figure that's nearly perfect. That is the ideal human behavior. <laughs> and yeah, I, you know, like I'm fine with him making mistakes. I guess my issue is that I didn't feel there was enough of a of a payoff. You don't really see. I mean, I guess he kind of learns from it because they fight Doomsday in a place and they make a point of saying like, "Oh, it's it's abandoned," but. Um, like, yeah, the fact that there was all this destruction to Metropolis in the first movie, he, snop, he snaps Zod's neck, and then he, you know, he, he screams. But then that's it. It's like yeah. the next scene, he's with the general in the desert, and he's laughing. He's like, I grew up in Kansas. It's just like, if you had seen more of, of the consequences, him wrestling with his decisions, I think it, it would have worked. And, and even, too, I thought it was so curious that they made such a big deal in Batman v Superman about this desert incident. They, they could have had him attend these Senate hearings for the destruction of Metropolis. Mm -hmm. Like, it just seems yeah. so weird that it's like... Half the city's destroyed, but it's like uh, some village, not, not that it's a minor thing, but right. it's like, you know, some villagers might have gotten killed, which as it turned out, and they explained it in the director's yeah. cut, they were not. So it turned out Lex was actually paying off like a relative of one of these villagers right. to say like, after Superman was here, like the government killed all of or my people. And that wasn't the case. And so the, it's sounding to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Damien. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and they burned the bodies too, to make it seem like Superman uses heat vision on them. Right. So like it was a total frame up job. <laughs> You have to go online after this, <laughs> yeah. and, or while I'm gone. Like, well, but you have to look up Lex's plan 
it is the most convoluted <laughs> nightmare scenario that he like he took like thirty steps where it could have taken like five yeah. to do what he had to do. So this is like a Doctor <laughs> Evil plan. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, like yeah. a billion dollars. Someone like went out and like spelled out. Okay, so now we have to burn the bodies. We have to do this. We have to do this. We have to do this. And it's just like this convoluted plan. Whereas like if Lex is who Lex Luthor is, it would have been five steps and it would have been taken care of. One but of it's the, something like fifty four steps or something ridiculous. One of the things that irritates me so much is in the man of steel jonathan kent makes the ultimate sacrifice he he dies to save someone else why is jonathan kent even in the man of steel if superman if clark didn't learn anything from this man it's as if he had no tutelage growing up about what the right thing to do is see to me the real superman is clark learns from these two earthlings who are probably the best of us mm -hmm. You don't see that in Batman versus Superman, and you don't see it in the second half of The Man of Steel. He, it's almost like, I'm Superman, and I'm just going to do whatever I do, and I don't care about the consequences. Because, yeah, I didn't have any parents that told me that, you know, things that you do have consequences. Well, he, he had the vision of Jonathan in, in Batman v Superman. Yeah, what was could, that? You know, Mike had that on his <laughs> list. Um, I don't know. I mean, it kind of made sense to me. It's like... You know, Superman is often in a very difficult spot, and it's like no matter what you do... There was a there was a line in, it reminded me of a line from Smallville from the final season where Clark w has a vision of his deceased father, and he's like, I feel like every time I do something right, I do something wrong, and that kind of summed up the show at the yeah. <laughs> 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 and where the character was at that point. But I think it was like a similar sentiment. It's because Jonathan's telling the story of how he's a kid and they you know there's a flood and they save their farm, but like they divert the water to the Langs and like, everything gets destroyed and the horses drown and all that. So it's like no matter what Superman does, like there are going to be consequences to it. And even when he does the right thing, what he thinks is the right thing, there might be these negative consequences. So Very good, but I think having that be a, a dream sequence, yeah. did that happen or is he dreaming? It would have been yeah. better It would have <laughs> yeah, been yeah. better Flashback. as a memory. Yes, yeah. I agree. It, yeah. It's never enough for Superman. The Superman we love, it's never enough. Like in Smallville, if you go online and search It's All My Fault... You get a super cut of Clark in every <laughs> single episode going, it's my fault. It's all my fault. Uh, I did it. It's all my fault. Like Superman yep. has this guilt that he can't do enough. David Goyer, when he talks about writing his Superman, goes, meh. <laughs> See, he can't do everything. There's, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but the whole thing about it's my fault. Uh, so in that same episode of Smallville, it's the season 10 premiere. Uh, at the towards the end of the episode, Clark makes this great save. He rescues Lois, and then he catches the Daily Planet globe, which was falling. And he's like really pumped up for like the first time. We're in season ten. It's like the first time. He's like so pumped up. He goes to the fortress, and he's talking to Jor-El, and he's like, "I did it! Like I saved all of these people. I'm ready." And Jor-El like just shoots him down. He's like, "You're so prideful. Like you're not ready." <laughs> <laughs> and it just I was like really like after all of it, like he finally gets to a decent point and just shoots him down but they needed to you know need yeah. to drag it out for another 20 episodes but that's the thing it's the CW gets that Superman is a Hercules story Zack Snyder with the Jesus references Superman is not Jesus Superman is Hercules <laughs> if you're gonna go and compare him to mythology I just, Zack Snyder just keeps doing stuff that I don't know why he keeps getting projects it's yeah so you know we've touched on you know Warner Brothers intent the strategy like the world building all of this stuff and I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's something that I was thinking about it's like again I've been okay with these movies like Man of Steel not my favorite depiction of Superman but like I was okay with the aspects of it I liked Batman v Superman we're talking about it but again the responses to these movies have not been great and they mm. keep doubling down on this yes. guy yes yes yeah. it's like I don't is it that they like, don't think anybody else can do it or wants to do it? I mean, or they just believe in his vision that much. I, but I don't know what it is. What we all know about Hollywood is it's asses in seats and how much money you make. True. If you spend $140 million making a film and then another $70 million marketing it, and it doesn't take in $210 million gross... At some point, somebody in the financial department's going to go. You got to cut this guy loose. He's he's bleeding money. We got to make movies that make money. Well, he has a vision. I don't care about his vision. I have a vision too, and that's returning shareholder yeah. value. That's what I have a vision of. Well, they just moved up Jeff Johns and are yeah. slowly phasing out Zack Snyder and hopefully Goyer because 
Goyer drives me nuts. <laughs> and why? And why? Why are the these two films, Man of Steel and Batman versus Superman, why are they so dripping with sepia tone nonsense? It's the oddest choice of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a bizarre color palette. They so desperately want to separate themselves from Marvel films, and Warner Brothers should because Warner Brothers, since its inception, has always been about the problem film. It is what is happening in society, and how can we show it. You know, that is what Warner Brothers has always been since it started. The Lego movie still holds up those values. Mm. These DC movies, that's where it could be different. Where Marvel and, like, Pixar and all those, like, films, I can turn my brain off and enjoy them and enjoy the moment and enjoy all of that. And even Winter Soldier had problems that right. they were touching on about government overstepping. DC does not do that. They're not doing that with these films. They're sort of doing that. Like, they're sort of touching on the problems, like they're sort of touching on the comic book characters and sort of touching on the stories of the comic books. They're not delivering. They want to really separate themselves from Marvel. It's not darkening your characters. It's not sending out a note to all the films, take out all the humor. It's touch on the problems and try and have these heroes do what they did in the 30s. And till now where they still hit the problems of society. I'm so glad you brought up Winter Soldier because to me that film is brilliant. It takes Captain America who's a Boy Scout mm -hmm. and Boy Scouts that innocent do-gooder personality doesn't apply in this era. The times we're living in now that's too simplistic. So Captain America really should be a hero out of time. He shouldn't play well in this era. They took Winter Soldier and they made a Boy Scout a badass and patriotism is cool, yeah. which it isn't no. right now. And to do that well shows that Marvel knows what they're doing. And very similarly, you should do that with Superman. Mm -hmm. Superman and Captain America are cut from the same yep. era. Yep. They are the best of us. Captain America is our savior and Superman is the Moses who came here from Europe. That's really what they mm -hmm. are. And when you can't take Superman and make him a lovable character as a good guy, and Marvel can with Captain America, there's something wrong with the people making these films. It's not something wrong with Superman. Yeah. Because once I saw Winter Soldier, I said, all right, now I know Superman is viable, just nobody at DC's figured it out. Yep. Mm -hmm. And... Morrison has. Grant Morrison always has. Every time Grant Morrison touches that character, it's about what he means to people. Whereas everyone's like, how do we make Superman relatable? No, it's how does Superman matter to people? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's what he shows people. It's what he does for people. It's not about how to make him cool or how to make him fun. It's he, He's never going to be fun. He's he's all powerful. He's It's about his humanity and what he shows people. It's not, you, you don't need to make him cool or Exciting. <laughs> yeah. And as far as, you know, what he means to people and all that, another reason why it bugged me that they went as far as the death of Superman, in addition to, I think, just being too much in one movie. Oh, Superman dies? But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it called to mind uh, a great line from Infinite Crisis, where Batman says to Superman, you know, like, let's face it, Clark, the last time you inspired anybody was when you were dead. And it's like, that's what happens in this movie. It's like he dies. He makes the ultimate sacrifice and he dies. And that's what it takes for people to, you know, finally understand what the S means and all of that. And it's, I would have really preferred if he had been able to inspire them in other ways besides dying. They could have done the death later on. I yes. Mean, that's a, you know, that's, you knew that would come at some point. But I felt like it was too soon. And, uh, yeah, it would have been nice to see him inspiring people before that. You know, Superman is what we aspire to. Like, Superman is the... What could we be? And Batman is who we are. I've always felt that Batman is who, like, vengeance and, you know, righting wrongs. That's a very human quality. But Superman, maybe that's something we can aspire to. And I didn't feel that that was the Superman in Batman versus Superman. I felt like the Batman, he's us. Yeah. You know, I do want to brand people with a symbol and say, you know, you did it. And I want to get even. And he's from another planet. That... Those are our worst base elements. But Superman is supposed to be the, the guy to remind us that we can aspire to something better. And he, he wasn't that character in this film. I would have loved to have seen... Uh, that's what I hated most about the Capitol scene. Like, Superman doesn't say a single word. Thank you. And <laughs> I, I thought that, was, that would have been a perfect opportunity to get his side of the story, why he does the things he does, what the symbol really stands for, why Superman is important, why Superman is needed. And we get none of that. 
Um, and, and that was my biggest fault in the movie. It's, it's a film called Batman vs. Superman, but it's really mostly Batman and featuring Superman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that bothered me a lot, too, mm. because, again, he... Like I said, one of my, my biggest problems, he, he has personality as Clark, and then he has Superman. It's just he's so, I mean, silent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's just like this brooding, floating yeah. figure. And when you do have an opportunity, like, because like, what do you stand for? It's like, well, what do you stand for? It's like, it'd be great to hear it. And you don't get that opportunity. That really bugged me. Yeah. One other, th- and it's funny, and I, at the top, I was like, I really enjoyed this. And I feel like <laughs> I'm not saying a lot of things that I didn't, but I really like this movie. But... Uh, this kind of made me laugh more than anything, but uh, when you know Lex sets up the fight, and you know Superman goes to Batman, and he tries at first to yeah. say like, "Listen, this is what's going on," and Batman doesn't give him a chance. But then, like, there's enough time where <laughs> Superman has the upper hand where he could just be like, "Listen," but like he just keeps like throwing Batman around. Yes. Yeah. But I, th- I look at it as like it's a moment of humanity. It's like he was pissed off. But it did make me laugh. But it's like, well, you could explain it now. Yeah. Like, like you, you have him. Yeah. Just hold him down <laughs> yeah. and talk to him. He just There's, kept beating him. <laughs> I think that's, like, up to the film, though. Like, they just wanted to have the fight. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. like, right. if it was a comic book, Batman would just be, like, railing into Superman and kicking. And Superman would be like, wait, 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 the whole time. Like, yeah. <laughs> there would be no fight on Superman's end because he knows he could just to take him out in one punch right but like the whole time superman should like if it was a comic book and not a film he would have been like no no hold on wait i got something oh <laughs> again <laughs> kryptonite come on okay <laughs> if i wanted it you'd be dead already uh, <laughs> that was one of the things i liked explaining how batman's voice changes oh there's a mic in the cowl that's cool <laughs> okay i like that because he's a gadget that batman's yeah. all about the gadgets they finally explained why batman's voice would change yeah. mm-hmm. Because, you know, like they never explained it in the Christopher Nolan movies. All of a sudden, Christian Bale puts on the cow and, oh, you just say, <laughs> it's like, where did that come from? So I, I thought that was a kind of a cool feature in the film. Yeah. Totally on a yeah. tangent. Mm. Uh, one other, uh, this is a bit of a tangent as well, but I figure I'd get your take on it. One of Mike's complaints was that Superman's cape was too long. That was actually probably one of the reasons why I was like, I have to do an episode on this movie. Because <laughs> I, when, I, when I saw this list, there's a lot of really legitimate stuff. But I got to that, and I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> this feels nitpicky to me. Th- but, you know, what was the cape too long for you guys? No. No. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't no it, was too, it was too long for effect, and I liked it when he was flying above the yeah. people in New Orleans. You know, yeah. I was like, that looks cool. That's a great visual. I, uh, I, yeah, I always thought the way the cave was animated in these films were really cool, especially Man of Steel. Like, when he takes the first flight, it's such a great scene. Yeah. Um, but no, nah, I, I, I've always envisioned Superman with a Lauren cape. I, the older comics, I always, I get it for, for the time where it was really short. Um, today, I, I, don't think, I don't think that works as much. But I also think, that, yeah, this is being very nitpicky. Um, I, I think sorry, Mike, you're yeah. being nitpicky. <laughs> yeah, I think, no, I think fans in general have been very nitpicky on this movie like i am more about the story i don't care about the costumes as much i mean they're important to the character but honestly the underwear on superman is silly but also the belt is silly there's but there needs to be something (laughs) in that area to break it up up, right but the both things are silly (laughs) the the belt look what does he need a belt for he doesn't (laughs) have holding up pants he's not holding up pants he doesn't have anything it's it gets nitpicky for fans because they're so passionate about it that they're going to start going into other things. Whereas I think none of those things would come up for people if the story and the characters were delivered well. Right. And sort of, you know, our, our time is, is kind of winding down, but that brings us to, you know, the other piece that I wanted to, to get at is the, the fan and the, and the critical reaction to this movie. So, you know, Mike and I, we were at Comic-Con together. We saw Batman The Killing Joke, the, the world premiere of the new animated adaptation. And th- very similar to this, like there were things in it that didn't sit quite right with me, but like I enjoyed it overall. Mike was bothered similarly by a lot of those things, but it completely ruined the experience for him. And we were talking about it and I said, because, you know, especially with, like, Batman v Superman going back and forth about it, and I'm like, there are things that I might not like or that I wish had been done differently or better, but it's like I'm not personally offended by it, mm-hmm. and it, it doesn't sour the entire viewing experience for me. Uh, but it seems like for a lot of fans, you know, for Batman v Superman, uh, you know, there, there really was a, a lot of dislike and a lot of... I mean, it sounds like from our discussion, you guys, you know, are, you know supportive of of those criticisms and that you you do agree but yeah i, I mean and damien i know you you know we you mentioned this earlier but i mean like i it really did seem like it people just were delighting and, and piling on mm-hmm. and it just it surprised me because even i think man of steel might be around like 50 percent or so on yeah. rotten tomatoes 
And that to me is like, okay, like that, that kind of makes sense to me. And if Batman v Superman were there as well, I, I would get that too. Um, but it just, it just felt like it was an unnecessary amount of hate. I think what it is is there's, there's the Man of Steel film has a more clear-cut narrative and it's easier to follow and it's a it's a it's a story whether you agree when it goes off the rails towards the end it pretty much follows a nice narrative this movie is disjointed a lot of bad decisions and choices were made bad edits were, it almost seems like Zack Snyder made a four-hour film and DC and Warner said no 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 you get two hours 20 minutes and that's it and then he went in and started chopping stuff out and then it doesn't make any sense yeah. and I really think think that's the problem people don't understand the film it bounced around like a pinball and you really didn't know where it was going what was happening i mean that whole scene with the jar of granny's whatever <laughs> th how much time did they waste on things like that throughout the film like you said with the yeah that was amazing <laughs> just things that that doesn't need you what you cut those other things and you left that in there could have been so much cut out and made it a better narrative and a more understandable narrative. I think putting more of the desert references in and taking some of the extraneous stuff out, you might have actually had a film people didn't like, but they liked it more. You give someone unbridled power, they won't kill their babies. <laughs> <laughs> like, there, like, there was stuff in Solace that should have been taken out, but it was completely my own, so I left it in. What Solace? Oh, it's my series. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we do. It's, it's well, you brought it up. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I made a series. It's called Solace. You it's can check YouTube. it out on YouTube. It's excellent. Thank you. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of babies that should have been killed in it. But I didn't because I had control over it. Zack Snyder had complete control over this movie, and he didn't do that. Whereas the opposite happened, I feel, with Suicide Squad. David Ayer didn't have enough control over it. He had four months to write the script, and then they hired a trailer editing company to edit the film. Oh, that's so bad. So every five oh, minutes, no. there's a new song, yeah. and it's snappy, and it's quick, oh, no. and it doesn't make sense. The movie you ask no anyone sense. who edits film, and you, you would know this because you mm -hmm. know the work you've done, and you would know this because of your documentaries, when you edit a trailer, Anybody who edits trailers will tell you that's an art. What I can do, film editors and directors can't do. Yeah. I, I have a specialized skill, and I can make something so exciting, and I can make it pop, but they can't deal with long-form storytelling because yep. that's not what they're skilled well, at. Well that's, well, that's what happens, and I feel like Man of Steel was concise. Like Whether or not I liked what they did with yeah. Superman, that is a good film. I think it's well-written. Uh, I. I, I'm saying that even though it's David Goyer, <laughs> but I think it tells a story and it has a theme and it delivers on it. Yes. Batman vs. Superman started to get a little muddy. Yeah. Suicide Squad is a complete mess. It is taking Batman, the issues with Batman vs. Superman and shining, like putting a microscope on them. So they, it's even more muddled than Batman vs. Superman. Yes. That's a, that's a but shame. Like, the, but now that we have Jeff Johns in charge, finally, yeah. he's going to be the fall guy for all of this when he should be the one who has the unbridled power. Right. Yeah, it's as far as, you know, there, I mean, there's a lot going on in the movie. No, like, no doubt. And as I said, I think there's a lot that, that could have gone. It's very odd to me, though, because, you know, their plans may have shifted, but it's like, I, I think there was the intent from the start to, like, do what Marvel's doing and have the shared universe and all that. Yet, Man of Steel, there's no attempt at expanding the world at mm -hmm. all. And I think if they had done anything in that movie, anything, even a post credit scene or whatever, even just a hint, uh, they would have had that much less to try to cram into this yep. movie. And even in this movie, you know, like there's no uh, mid-credit or, or post-credit scene. And I don't know, maybe they feel like, oh, that's a Marvel thing, we don't want to do that. But it's like, they could have taken all that nightmare stuff and done like a super cut of that and tack that on at the end. And at least it's like, oh, okay, like there's something else coming here and you have that hint but it's not like shoehorn right into the, the middle of the movie going back to what I said before is I really believe Superman returns if that had been an effective reintroduction of Superman there is no Christopher Nolan trilogy although that would make me very sad because I'm a big fan of it I think then you would have had the DC Universe Ben Affleck or whoever gets chosen to play Batman now you have the DC Universe you have that Superman, you have this, and we're building the universe. They didn't do that. They reintroduced Superman from the continuation of the Donner films, which is 
nuts. You should never have done that. And then they don't have any idea of what they're doing. So Christopher Nolan gets carte blanche to do whatever he wants with Batman because it was so badly damaged as a franchise. And now he made this standalone trilogy that's not in their universe and they're trying to play catch up. Yeah. And it's really it's really evident when you watch the film that they're like, oh shit, we forgot that. Oh, do this. Do and it's like all of a sudden it's a muddled mess because nobody has a long term plan. I really don't believe their plan is long term because it would have been better executed if it was because I think there should have been a Batman introduction mm -hmm. there should have been a, a Wonder Woman introduction and then you could have a Trinity film and you could have all three of them instead of it's Batman versus Superman yeah mm -hmm. well gentlemen I think we are just about out of time is there anything else anyone would like to say about the film I'm excited that Ben Affleck is going to direct the Batman film yeah for yes. sure because I thought yeah. Argo was really great yeah and he's proven he can direct. He's a great filmmaker. He yeah. is. And he's got a love of film. And I, he gets this character. Mm -hmm. He understands it. He knows how to play it. He played it so well. Like the scene with Gal Gadot and the sword in Batman versus Superman. That for both of those characters, that was note perfect. Yeah. It was like he was so smooth, suave, condescending, in control. And she took the control away from him. Yeah. And it was like these two really are, they're dueling with words. Yeah. It really reminded me of the Just League Animated Series between them two. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess my final notes is, like you said, I'm excited for Batman. Um, I'm really excited for Wonder Woman. That trailer I thought was the best trailer at Comic-Con this year. And with Jeff Johns being like the head of everything now, and if Rebirth has been any indication for DC so far, it might be a brighter future ahead for all of us. Let's hope. Yeah. I felt that there was going to be a bright future at the end of <laughs> Batman vs. Superman because I saw the potential that they opened up with what where they left off. But after seeing Suicide Squad, I have no hope anymore. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to do a follow-up episode after we've all seen uh, Suicide Squad. Uh, well, I hope listeners enjoyed this discussion on Batman v Superman. Uh, like I said at the top, I enjoyed it. I think uh, it's it's worth a watch, certainly if you haven't. And if you did watch it and it didn't work for you, uh, that's fine. But maybe give it another shot. With the directors, the ultimate yeah, cut. Watch mm. the extended cut, for sure. Um, but it's definitely an imperfect movie, but uh, there was enough that I thought they got right that I enjoyed it, and I would certainly recommend it to, yeah. to people. But thank you all. This was really uh, a very thorough, it was a great discussion. I think people will enjoy this. So thank you very much to the listeners. Thank you for listening. Keep on listening, and don't be a flat squirrel. My Comic Shop History is a flat squirrel production please visit flatsquirrelproductions.com to explore my other projects, including my comic shop documentary, By Spoon, The J. Mizell Story, and the forthcoming Wacky Man, The Rise of a Puppeteer. Be sure to subscribe to My Comic Shop History on iTunes and catch up on Season 1. Like My Comic Shop History on Facebook and follow me on Twitter at Desi Westside. Likes, ratings, and reviews are always greatly appreciated. Thank you for listening and continuing to support this show. Welcome to My Comic Shop History. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. I am joined today by a very special guest who I'm happy to finally have on the show. Please welcome Mr. Greg Schiegel. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. So just a few moments ago, we finished recording a commentary track for a documentary that I made and that you're in. Yes. And that you contributed art for. True. Both of those are facts. All three of those things are facts. So I've mentioned on the show like once or twice, uh, but it stars Zach Walliner, who has been on the show before. The Z-Man. The Z-Man. And it is all about his journey as a puppeteer. So it's called Wacky Man, The Rise of a Puppeteer. It's a very good... Look, taking out the bias that I'm in this thing, which, you know, there's there's my own just like, oh, look at me on the screen. That's weird. It's a... Anthony did a tremendous job. This really is a good movie. It's a little over an hour and uh, it's good. It is good. He did a nice job. There's there's uh, there's real skill in the editing and the production of this movie. So what I'm getting at with this is, yeah. listeners, please, there's a documentary coming out. <laughs> yeah, basically, by, get this documentary. It's coming out on Vimeo in uh, in uh, November. In November, by the time this episode airs, the documentary will be up for pre-order. Yeah. So, but yeah, we had a great time recording the commentary. Yeah, and yeah, and that's bonus. That's actual added value. If you if you're not sick of hearing us by the time this is over and you want to hear us talking more about something else, that's another way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. So at this point, we might be sick of hearing each other's voices, but we're not. <laughs> we're going to do good. 
Yeah, I think as because you are a fellow podcaster, I think I you know we, we maybe like the sound of our own voices. Took me a while to adjust to the sound of my own voice. Every now and again, like watching that documentary again, I'm like, and maybe the visual component throws me off because how often am I looking at myself? Never. Right. My voice, I've gotten a little more used to, although it is still weird. I must just be an egomaniac then, because I'm like, I'm okay with it. Oh, no, I'm okay with it, except I guess because I put my show on hiatus a bit, I haven't listened back to myself as much. as, And then my the other podcast, the Cruising Together show, just waiting for the next Tom Cruise movie. So I haven't had as much opportunity to hear myself speak. So there's some distance. I think once it, once that starts happening again, and I'm hearing myself more often, I'll, I, you know, it's a quick adjustment. When I re-listen to this, it'll take me maybe 30 seconds and i listen to most of my podcasts at double speed so it's a whole other trip. oh okay yeah. gotta pack them all in man that's right yeah so you mentioned cruising together yes you have another podcast called yes. stuff said stuff said yes so if listeners of this show want to check out either or both of those where can they find them if you go to hatterentertainment.com h-a-t-t-e-r entertainment.com that's my main website and that'll that'll take you to everything cruising together lives there stuff said has its own site but you can get to it through hatter my books. I'm also a cartoonist, so you can get information about that. So that's the hub. So I have taken to calling this episode Other Side of the Table. Right. And in particular, that's a reference to the original art episode that uh, was earlier this season where I spoke with uh, three friends, alternate realities, community members who are all big original art collectors, either commissions or uh, original pages. And it was a very thorough discussion about the ins and outs of that. And I thought it would be interesting since we have a comic book creator here, someone who's on the other side of the table when someone comes up at a convention or a signing and they want to sketch. So I was curious just to get, you know, your perspective on that whole process. So I should preface this by pointing out. So the comics I tend to do or the comics I mostly do, I, I, my main job is I'm a contributor to SpongeBob comics. So I draw SpongeBob comics. I occasionally write a story in there. And then I self-publish my own book. I've done work for Marvel Comics. I did that back in the late 90s, like 97, 98, 99. And I haven't really done that much work at Marvel or DC. I think it's been licensing stuff. So my experience is slightly different in that regard because the pages, if I'm selling original pages, it's SpongeBob stuff. And that has a very different value, let's say, in the comic book art collecting world right and then when i'm doing sketches and stuff i don't have a known character like you know if you go up to i don't know let's think of a name if you go to mark bagley you're probably gonna ask for spider-man and then he has the go-to and then if you want something else you get so with me it really becomes a case of i'm not as much as i've been drawing comics for or comics or things related to comics since 1997 it's a pretty good clip I'm not known for anything in particular. You know, people that are really paying attention, like, oh, he's the guy that drew the last issue of What If with the Secret Wars kids. But that's few and far between. There are people that maybe know the Spider-Man anti-drug story Fast Lane that I drew in end of 99, 2000. But nobody's asking me to draw Spider-Man as a result of that. They just remember this thing. So my experience is slightly different. So hearing those guys talk about the artists they like and what they're seeking out, I don't get that kind of experience i also don't charge that kind of money because you know you sort of figure out where you are in the in the game of things so from my experience the experience of doing conventions sort of goes like this so i'll go to a convention now i have my book that i bring with me picks picks one weirdest weekend yes available at pixcomic.com or on amazon or at your local comic store if they don't have it ask them to order it it helps I know for a fact that they have it at All Yeah Comics because that's where I bought a copy for my niece. So there you go. There you go. And if they don't have it, say, hey, oh, yeah, order some more. And then they then that order goes to Diamond. Then Diamond orders with me and everything is good. Anyway, uh, so my experience at the table. So I usually go, if I'm at a show, uh, I sit at the table. I set things up. I usually have a sign that indicates what I'm charging. And I, I go pretty baseline because I, I don't do color just because I, I'm, I'm probably behind the times on that one because they're bringing out these Copic markers and going to town and I just draw black and white. Uh, I, I try to do them on the spot kind of a thing. But basically I charge what I charge for, you know, I have a thing, full figure, headshot slash busk and you bust and usually have to explain to somebody what that means because not everybody understands the terminology. And then I have a, a, a lesser tier is if you want a SpongeBob character, those are cheaper because that's usually a kid 
And, okay. You know, kid wants you just can you draw Patrick? Yeah, and then you just give it to him because. That'd and then, be twenty bucks, kid. Yeah, <laughs> can't, you can't do that to a little kid. And then, uh, then if you know your SpongeBob stuff, Gary and Plankton are the cheapest because they're very easy to draw. Uh, but yeah, you set up at a table, and you kind of, in my circumstance, I have a binder out with sketches that people can buy or just see the way I draw, and that's usually what draws anybody in is they'll see the sketches and they go, "Oh, this looks cool," if they think it looks cool. Not everybody does, and then they'll decide they want something drawn. Um, and then, and then you just start, I mean, I just start drawing. I draw at the table because it is, what else am I doing? Like, <laughs> like that's why I'm there is to, is to sit and do the drawing. So I don't do as much of the, the big commissions those guys were talking about. That doesn't happen as often for me. Every night, there were years when I was at San Diego where somebody would say, can you do a drawing of, you know, the core five Teen Titans and make it like a double page spread in this sketchbook? And in that one, be like, yeah, I'm going to have to bring it back tomorrow. Like I'm going to need the night to work on this. And in that case, they're paying per character. It becomes a bigger, a bigger ticket item. So in that case, it's it's a t- it's homework. It's a- in that other episode, Tom talked about how he would have a similar experience with with an artist, and he would call them throughout the night to make yeah, sure. Yeah, that was insane. <laughs> so okay, so that story, the artist said, "Do it." Right. So in that case, I get it. Uh, I I wouldn't. I mean, that was wild because on the one hand. I think I just play it way more conservatively. If I'm like, I don't think I can do it, I'm going to say I can't do it. And if I say I can do it, I can do it. But that that was a crazy story. Tom's a very passionate, intense guy, yeah. especially when it comes to his art. So it's like, if there's anybody that you probably shouldn't tell, like call me throughout the night, it's him, because he will, and he did. Yeah, no, and it obviously worked to his advantage because he needed to keep on that guy's butt. I mean, look, I've heard many horror stories. None of those guys name names, and I won't, necessarily either but there are definitely people who have who take on a commission and then somebody won't get their piece until four or five years down the line i can't imagine doing that i mean i've had people reach out to me when i'm not doing conventions and say are you doing commissions and i'm like i'm not i don't i only do them when i'm at conventions now i might be limiting some income by doing that but for me it's a case of when i'm home i should be working on something else i should be working on my book i should be working on work for hire or something I've been fortunate that I haven't had to say I'm opening up commissions. I may get to that point at some, you know, I need to pay to print this book. So who wants drawings of whatever? Uh, but I've been, I've been pretty lucky in that regard. But either way, uh, yeah, so that's usually what people come up, request something, something that happens quite a bit. I don't know if it just happens to me and the guys I roll with, but you get a lot of people that want to challenge you. Really? Yeah, like they... The, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. like... I've got a challenge for you. Like, all right, what is it? It's like, and I, I mean, I've done some of them. You draw Spider-Man and Venom in a presidential debate. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> that's been one. That's uh, that's def- <laughs> it's on my website. You can find it. Can you draw Batman uh, listening to an iPod and getting frustrated? Sure. Like, I don't know what the joy is in that. It's actually that one has actually a pretty good drawing. Like, I I, which I drew that one. I remember as drawing. I'm like, this is I'm nailing this one. He had bad headphones. Okay, so you'll do them though. You won't turn those down. What if I turn down? There was one guy, <laughs> such a creep. A guy came up and he looked at me and he goes, do you ever do any, uh, uh, I think he, he might have said nude or topless. I can't remember. Drawings. And then he raised his eyebrows up and down. Like, I don't know what you call that, but you know what I mean? Oh, geez. Like the up and down eyebrows thing. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. On the other hand, there is a guy out there. And I say guy because it is a man. There is a guy out there who, wants specifically drawings of characters i think mostly female superheroes without shoes on and like clearly there's something going on there right but i didn't i didn't say no i drew wonder girl without her shoes on and it was a low angle because i figured that'll help that's what he was looking but, for <laughs> but it was just like <laughs> but i'm just like all right that's a thing that's his and then there's a i remember a sketchbook where it's characters drinking something characters with a drink every you know fine if you're gonna pay for it it's fine I, I I don't know how I I don't like drawing likenesses. Can you draw me as so and so? I've done that a couple of times, but normally I'll shuffle that to my friend Jacob. If things get way too complicated, and I know I won't have time to do it. I'll I'll straight up say I don't have time to do it. Uh, I don't. There's gonna be now just that guy complaining. The best is when somebody shows up and they have the reference and they're ready and they're like, "Here's what I'd like. This is reference. Hold on to all of it." And I'll come back or tell me when to come back. And here's the money. Like they pay up front. And they're like, this is the best. 
it's if you if you are so and i think the guys that and gals that really are into this stuff although i think it's almost as far as sketchbooks go or sketch covers it's almost in my experience it's mostly guys when when ladies come up they do they're they're there a lot of times they want me to draw their i've had in san diego there was a pair of sisters they wanted me to draw their pets i'll do that before i do a likeness can you draw my dog of course i'll draw your dog can you draw my guinea pigs sure there was one lady in san diego who wanted me to draw her guinea pigs as power man and iron fist and that was more fun than i thought it would be and this lady's reaction was gold like she almost dropped to the floor laughing and that was fun cool yeah well it's fun i mean do you find it odd when someone comes up with that request for example for someone nude or topless when you are primarily known for drawing this children's comic well okay is that so, part of the thrill for them no i don't so at the time when that happened i i think i'd done sun spongebob stuff but it was long enough ago that pix wasn't even i think i had the pix maybe as a mini comic so i wasn't again i'm not known for anything even the okay. fact that i do pix people don't know it so okay. it's a you know, pretty small print run so as far as people are concerned they're just seeing oh you draw this stuff this looks cool i think if people are paying attention to what's on a the table they may say oh what's this but even then, they may not know it's a book for you know ten to twelve year olds, or, or nine True. and up, or whatever. So it's I think there's just a little bit of people not paying attention, or just I mean he asked he didn't just straight up say, can you draw me a topless, I don't know black canary just looking at your shelf over there. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it's I think it's just it might be the general awkwardness of comic book people, which we all have in some degree. <laughs> I try and charge what I think is a fair price, but I don't collect art, so I have no idea. Like hearing what those guys were spending on art was eye-opening. But well, also, they were um, being very modest. I that can day. imagine. Uh, I forget either. I think it was Tom, and I asked like, how many, how much have you spent on art? And he's like, oh, a few thousand. He spends a few thousand at one show. Yeah. No, no, and, and they again, were very modest that day. Which is again, you know, people don't like to talk money so much, but you know, I I hear that, and it's like, oh my god. But then I go, I don't, I can't justify. And that's my own maybe lack of ego or whatever. But I know part of it is who are you? Who are you getting art from? What is their cachet in the business versus how good is the art? Those are two separate things. Like there are people that charge a lot of money whose work I'm not particularly fond of. But, but they, they have, have a name. They have a name. They have a thing. There's probably a way to flip that sketch if they're doing that sort of thing. You know, that's a whole other world that I've... I don't think I've ever seen any of my drawings getting flipped on eBay. I wouldn't know if they were. Would you care if, if would that bother you? Because I know for some creators that's you know a no no. I think it would depend on on the nature of the beast. I mean, it hasn't happened, so I can't tell you. But I mean, if you if you play me a scenario, I'll tell you how I'd react to it. Well, what if it was like one of those odd, unusual ones, like those challenge ones? Yeah. And it seems like this is something they really want. Oh, I think at that point <laughs> I'd be like, if you can sell it, God, God bless you, man. Cause okay. Who else would want that? Like, who else? If the guy that got, okay, so there was a guy in San Diego, and I haven't been to San Diego in three or four years, but there was a guy who always come up and he would have a sketch cover or something, and he would always want SpongeBob and Patrick doing something odd. And he was a guy who came back every year, so you build some sort of rapport when you start seeing the same people yeah. over again. Speaking of people coming up over and over, we've mentioned on the show before how the previous guest, Rich Roney, yes. has gone up to Mark Wade at numerous conventions, always wearing the same thing. <laughs> Do you so you have your own Rich Ronies, people who you, you oh, there's recognize? There's definitely people there are definitely people you recognize. I unfortunately don't remember all their names. But there are definitely there was a guy in San Diego. His his name was Gordon. I eventually learned his name. But he always wanted he was really into anime and manga and he would come up and ask it was mermaids mostly. And he'd ask to do these drawings and he was great because he would show up day one of San Diego and have a list have his reference in folders and he'd hand me the reference, he'd hand me paper. And he would just come back throughout the weekend to check on stuff. And it was amazing because that would pay for, uh, when the hotels were cheaper, like one and a half nights of the hotel. And I'd just work on him throughout the weekend when I had time. And he was never, he, there was no pressure. And I knew he was, he'd come back and pay. Like there was no issue there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so the regulars, I love the regulars because you learn about them. Oh, you're getting married. There's, I had a few instances. I mean, there was this one girl, Lorelai, who first started showing up when she was 13 years old 12 years old like we're friends on facebook she's a grown-up she like has a job now it's nice it's like that's sort of cool yeah when you're not a when you're not super big and famous you actually can have these conversations you meet these little kids parents i end up hanging out with mostly other cartoonist people so i don't do a lot of 
let's go hang out with like they, you know those your guys were telling stories about going to dinner with creators and stuff right. i haven't done much of that once or twice i've i've had somebody who was a fan quote it's a weird thing to say like join us in a social circumstance but i that, then with the problem with me there is then i feel then i would feel bad charging for anything like, yeah you know what i mean because i yeah, then you're blurring the line yeah like i'll draw things this has happened where i you know this this was actually a lot of fun i was in san francisco for WonderCon, and we'd gone to bob's donuts at midnight for fresh donuts and it was me and chris Russo and i think jacob shabbat was there and eric larson was with us and i'm doing a sketch in somebody's book an avenger sketchbook i think it was an avenger sketchbook and Eric's like, what is that book? And I show him it. And he just went to the middle of the book and just drew the Hulk. Like just ran, like, you know, this, and this guy will eventually come across that page. And he's got a free Eric Larson sketch because Eric Larson was bored. And I had finished the sketch and he's like, what's the sketchbook about? Avengers. And he just draws the Hulk. Like that can happen. And you can get free drawing sometimes if people are just doodling around. But then, then you, it does that blurs that line. Because arguably I'm there to try and make some money. Right. Like, why else would I take a weekend away? Which becomes a new, a new challenge in terms of figuring out the pricing. So I came up with this metaphor. It's a sports metaphor. Can we handle it on my comic shop history? I don't know. There hasn't been much sports talk. All but right. we'll, we'll, maybe we can roll Look, with it. I'm not a sporto, but this is a, <laughs> this is a working metaphor. So doing a convention, this feels like such a disjointed rambling, but it maybe it'll make sense to people. Doing a convention is like if you're watching football. People know Super Bowl at the very least. Oh, yeah. Football is running back and forth on the field, gaining yardage, touchdowns, field goals, extra points, etc. So then they take a timeout. So if a convention is like taking a timeout from the game, but during the timeout, you're running sprints, which is to say you're doing all the work of the game, but you're gaining no yardage <laughs> and you're making no progress. And then the game has to start again. So basically, if San Diego is the biggest like most brutal time out of them all. But basically you're, you're leaving whatever work you're working on to go to this convention. And while you're at that convention, you're working pretty much nonstop and talking all day only to come home and get back to work. It's brutal. It's just, I mean, I do less conventions than I used to because I'm trying to work on books and trying to get something else going because there are people that become, you know, like a, like a road dog. We're just doing shows and you're doing conventions and you can earn a living that way. I just, I want to tell stories and conventions is not telling stories. It's doing drawings. Right. And nobody's buying, you know, not nobody, but my original art is not a thing that is, people aren't buying SpongeBob pages as a general rule because. Yeah, I was going to ask about original pages. Yeah. So I have, in my time at Marvel, I drew three issues of What If, one issue of Generation X, an X-Man cover, and this Spider-Man anti-drug thing and then a bunch of licensing stuff. It's such a small amount of work that I've, it's still sentimental to me and I don't really sell those pages. I've sold a couple of covers to a guy that was collecting every what if cover, except he will never have them all because the first cover I ever drew for Marvel comics, I still own. Like I can't, I've been unwilling to sell it. He's offered me good money for it. And I was like, but that's the first, it's my first book and my first cover. Yeah, that's tough. It's hard. It's hard to just be like, yeah, sure, I'll sell this to you because I know you'll like it. But it's like, I also like it. I've given a couple of pages to, like in that last issue, What If, Jay Ferber wrote that. It was his first comic he wrote. I gave him one of the pages. I've done that. But for the most part, I still have all my Marvel stuff. The SpongeBob stuff, I'll sell it to anybody, anybody who wants it. So SpongeBob and, and Pix, are you still drawing both of those on paper or no. on digital? Yeah, at this point, I do everything digitally too. So... At some point, the SpongeBob pages will become rarer because they just don't exist. But even there, again, it's it's the audience for SpongeBob is young people, and by young people I mean kids, like under twelve. So even at twenty five dollars a page, which is what I sometimes put the big stack of SpongeBob, they're not buying them because the parents aren't going to buy them because the kid can't just color that in because it's original art and it costs twenty five dollars for a single drawing. The kid's not going to know what in original art is so i'm kind of hedging my bets that in another 10 years there'll be a bunch of disposable income 30 year olds that will remember and then they'll buy them have you ever run into the situation where you've done a sketch a commission whatever and the person who commissioned it is 
it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. Have you ever had that? Oh, man, I'm perfect every time out of the gate. No, I've, <laughs> I've not had that happen. I've had situations where somebody hands me a sketchbook and it's, it's not a spiral bound book. It's a hardcover book. And I'm working on a sketch and I make a mistake and I feel terrible because that's a page in their sketchbook. More often than I can, I can salvage it, but I know the mistake is there. There's a guy, I mentioned him earlier, this, this guy, Jeff Streeter, who I met at Heroes Con one year, and he had me do a drawing of Red Devil. I think it was Blue Devil's sidekick, one of the Titans. It's a really good drawing. I mean, not to sound like I'm stroke, you know, uh, uh, stroking my own ego, but it, it was cool. I was very happy with the drawing. It wasn't until after the fact that I realized I forgot he has wings under his arms, and they are not in there. I had never drawn this character, so I'm not going to know him inside and out. But to this day, it bothers me that he doesn't have those wings. Now, Jeff has been fine about it. He's like, it's, it's a great drawing. Don't worry about it. But I know there's a mistake in that drawing. And then I look at comic art fans and I see old stuff I've done. I'm like, that's an old drawing. I could have done better. That's a little, that's some wonky stuff there. So I, I think I'm more of my own harsh critic. I also think I don't charge that much for sketches. So I think the bar isn't, like I'm not charging hundreds of dollars for somebody. And if And if it gets to the part where it's, six characters and it's going to end up being in the hundreds i'm going to give it a little more attention and make sure that people are getting their money's worth not that i crap everything else out but what, drawing a single figure of high of, of um his name high father from the new gods was yeah. that yeah i've done that and i'm like i've never drawn this guy i have no true affection for the new gods i'm gonna do my best versus somebody saying you draw the beast. I love the beast. I'm like, yeah, I'll draw you the beast. It's gonna be the best beast you've ever seen. Like, this is gonna be sweet. I don't know that anybody's ever been brutally disappointed. Thankfully, they haven't told me at least. Oh, I'm sure they haven't. Uh, and you know, you just try and do the best you can. I think I, I think there was maybe once I did something and it, I wasn't thrilled with it. So like, took some. I like, you know, you don't have to pay like pay me less. I think I've done that <laughs> once or twice. Where I'm like, listen, I messed this up. So let, let's say it was thirty. I'm like, just give me twenty. We'll be fine. And then they usually like say no way and they give me the full amount. But for my own sake, like just please. In that other episode, we talked about how Tom will on occasion kind of tweak the art of something. Yeah, that missing. was fascinating. How would you feel about that if someone, like with the, with the wings that were missing, yeah. if that fan was artistically inclined and they drew them in themselves, would that, I mean, on the one hand, obje- object to that? On the one hand, I'd be like, you know what? Again, you paid for it. It's yours. Do with it what you will. Like, I've done drawings for little kids, and, you know, the kid clearly wants to color this thing in. And the parent's like, no, no, you can't do it. It's, ori- it's, it's original. And I'm just like, I want to tell the parents, I'm like, just let them color it. Like, it's, it's, don't worry about it. But then what I've come to say now is, if you make a photocopy of it, they can color that. Like, well, that's a good idea. I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> like, the kid, just let the kid color. I, I think, okay, so if I was in that circuit, if I was an artist and I did a drawing and the person wanted to tweak it, I think what it would what would bother me would be is if there wasn't a notation on the art indicating okay. that it was tweaked. Because if it's a tweak that doesn't really look that good, and again, I would notice it. Somebody doing the tweak might not notice it. As artistically inclined as you think they might be, it might not quite be the line weight, something might be off. I don't know. I haven't seen any of these tweaks that Tom has made. So I apologize, Tom. I don't mean to yeah, you, you don't want to get gunny sacked. I do not want to get gunny sacked. So in that instance, I would kind of, I mean, ideally, if, they had, if they're like, oh, can you fix this? I would try and fix it on the spot. If they went and fixed it themselves and I saw it later, I guess I'd be like, at least make a note that like, you know, this art by so-and-so wings by me. <laughs> Just in case, I mean, if they look great, sure, I'll take the credit. But if they don't, I don't want to take the hit. I mean, I've seen sketches of mine get colored by people. That's cool. Doesn't bother. And, they, and it's noted, like, sketch by so-and-so, color by so-and-so. This show, called My Comic Shop History, yeah. born out of the closing of a comic shop, in addition to going to comic book conventions yeah. as a creator, you also go to comic book shops, yes. I assume as a customer, but also to do signings and in the hopes that they'll stock your, your work and, I have and things done like that. that. So if, if in, in any of those instances, what sort of things do you look for in a comic shop? Oh, okay. So as a, okay, this is an interesting question. I had not thought of this. So I've done comic book conventions. I've done library conventions, which I love. Those are great. That is a very small kind of situation where a library says we're doing a convention for a day and they set up the tables and you go in and it's usually free to get in. 
those are delightful because those are people that are genuinely interested in books. It's, it's at a library. I like those a lot. Nobody's buying art at those. I don't even bring art to those. I just bring books. And then there's a, a comic shop appearance. I like comic shop appearances because, again, it's about the book. So the stores I've done appearance, I did a, I've done appearances at All Yeah Comics. I've done appearances at uh, the comic book shop in Wilmington, Delaware. That's a great store. And I've done well, so is All Yeah Comics. Let me just preface: all these are great <laughs> stores. And I've done a bunch of appearances at Acme Comics in North Carolina. Yes, friends of this show. That's right. Uh, they so they fly me down for Free Comic Book Day, which is a whole. I mean, their Free Comic Book Day is a beast. Oh, you get flown down for it. Oh, that's I want to get nice. flown down for. It. Yeah. So here's here's what I get in exchange for that. Here's what I do in exchange for that. Here's how Acme Comics' free comic book day works. And it is, again, a beast of a day. They set up their... They get every book. And if you wait online, you get every book. It's not pick five of the 20. You get every, you get a, buy, a bag, a staple bag with everything in it. And they have two... They, separate, they have one bag that's all ages, and they have one bag that has the more grown-up stuff in it. Mm-hmm. And you ask what you want. Once you've gone through that line, you get a ticket for a sketch, for what they call the sketch cave. In that sketch cave, there's probably anywhere from eight to fourteen artists, and we are drawing all day. Like we get, it starts I think at nine thirty or ten, and we go from ten to five, and you just draw. And I'm just you're just doing quick sketches, all day long. I do I tend to do headshots because I'm trying to get as many people through the line as possible. But yeah, you just draw, free sketches all day, and it is more fun than you could possibly imagine working non-stop all day but you're sitting around with a bunch of other cartoonists and everybody's sort of you're in like the trenches together and the stakes are lower because nobody's you're not you're really always paying for these sketches you're just you're, you're making people happy very quickly yeah can you draw this can you draw that can you draw door the explorer is darth vader that's a real one and you're like yeah sure and i have you know they have wi-fi so i have my ipad there and i'm looking reference up and i'm able to just do these things and it's a lot of fun do i sell books at something like that harder to gauge because it's free comic book day and there's a different agenda on the other hand when you do an actual store appearance like all year or the comic book shop or acme where i plan to go when my next book is ready what's nice about that is they order books whether for me directly or through diamond and that means book sales and the whole point of doing these appearances is to sell books and that i like doing again my shit my focus has shifted as a comic book maker from Making cash at a show to pay for the show, which is was the goal for a long time, to finding shows where it is going to be, where selling books is going to help me out. What was, the original question was, what am I looking for in a store? I want, here's, ideally, this would be the best circumstance. Somebody that knows what the book is, knows how to attract the audience for that book to come into the store that will then move units or get people slightly interested in what I'm doing. So... If I go to a store and this this has not happened, but if I go to a store and they don't have copies of my book, then why? What's going on? Especially if they didn't say bring copies and I'll buy them from you, I can do that. But if they say come to the store and they have nothing, then I don't know what to do. I mean, I could do sketches, but then then I. Well, that begs the question: It's like, why did you ask me yeah, here in the first place? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so you know, you want a store to to know who you are enough that. They can promote the appearance and make it worth everybody's while. I'm going to bring what I'm going to bring. I'll do sketches all day. I'll work, man. I'll work my ass off. If you, if you take the time to have me out to your store, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come strong. And I'll do free sketches all day long if you're selling my book. Because that's why I'm there. Like, free sketches are great, but I'm, it's, I, I want, you know, you want there to be some sort of partnership where I'm there because you've asked me to be there. And the, and the idea of selling these books is going to help you make some money. It's going to bring traffic into the store, but everybody's happy. You can really set things up in a way that are specific and cater to the clientele, and the stores know their clientele better than anybody else. I like that kind of focus, that kind of attention to detail, attention to the audience, that kind of thing. Now, that sounds awesome. I especially like this deal with, with uh, Acme where they fly you down and you draw all day. I mean, listen, Stephen, Jermaine... If you want somebody to come on Free Comic Book Day and podcast, I podcast all day. <laughs> they, I don't yeah. know how interesting that would be for the uh, customers, but I don't know, maybe. Anything's possible. <laughs> I mean, they have their own podcast. They do, they do. But they're also super busy during that Yeah, that's weekend. the thing. I, that's right. 
could keep the podcast going while they're helping out the customers. Do it. You could do a documentary about Free Comic Book Day. Yeah. Focused on Acme Comics. Well, they'll hear this and then they'll be like, "Oh, that's not a bad." Idea. Jermaine <laughs> will be like, "That's not a bad idea." And Steve will be like, "Listen, <laughs> we gotta look at the budget." Da da da. And then they'll they'll work it out. And they're either laughing at this or being like, "Stop talking about us." <laughs> they're laughing. I'm sure of it. Yes, I don't know them as well as you do, but I I would venture that they're laughing as well. I I know I'll make it there at some point, and I, I am excited to finally uh, get to that store. They're they're a good group of guys. It's a good store. It's a very it's it's you know there are stores nowadays that don't have back issues. There are stores nowadays that have limited selection. Like they are a full service operation. Like they they probably have more than they need. I mean, they have full back issue bo- like. Yeah, you don't, so you don't see that a lot anymore. You don't see that a lot. And they have huge shelves of graphic novels, and they have they now have Acme Comics Presents, which is where all the kids' comics and the, the ancillary stuff, T-shirts and your pop finals, your beloved, oh, beloved yeah. pop finals. Before we sat down to record, I, <laughs> we were walking into the building, and I got a, a package delivered. You did. And it was the Hot Topic exclusive Clark Kent pop. Two. Uh, I got two of them. They're adorable. They are, right? They're awesome. They're so cool. I'm looking at them right now. They're right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> they are um did you ever did you ever go to alternate realities never never i never heard of it until your podcast <sighs> sorry that's okay. but it sounds but from the description it sounds like a store that would not be where uh pics would be of any note no i mean we can no i mean I don't was know. there yeah i mean okay. we definitely had our kids section okay no we did there was a spinner rack and there was a whole section with uh all the archie stuff and everything sure. yeah yeah okay I just I've been look I was in I was in Miami I'm from Miami originally and I was walking around went to a bunch of stores there, and it was it was just depressing how many of these stores have nothing, no real attention to the idea that a kid could be going in there. I'm curious. I mean, this is really not so much within the realm of, of collecting or stores or anything, but your self published book. Yes. Because I imagine you face a lot of the same things that I do in you know making a documentary and distributing it myself. So. Yeah, I mean, I was just curious about what that process is like. I mean, less so the the creative end. Not that I'm not interested in that, no. but but more so like getting it out there, the production aspect. I mean, how does that work? You go to a printer and you, I mean, how does, what's that process? Okay, so the process works as follows. So I, I had slight advantage of having worked in, con- I was an assistant editor at Marvel. I've seen books get produced. I have other people that have produced work for Image, so I know how to do things independently as well. So basically it is, it is, simpler on one end than you realize and more complicated than the other. So the printing is simpler than you realize. You just have to know a little bit of stuff. So for instance, there are online companies that will print your books. I I would not recommend that. The unit prices are too high. It's just, it's not, there's, it's, I'm going to spin a little bit. There's two types of printing. There's offset printing and there's digital printing. Offset printing is printing press. Okay. Your different color plates, they make metal plates, they spin the paper through it, it cuts it, it trims it the whole nine yards. Digital printing is big, giant digital printers. They'll still feed the paper through and cut it and trim it all, but it's not, it's not your traditional CMYK printing ink printing press thing. So digital printing is usually good for smaller print runs. When you get print on demand, that's a digital printed book. Offset printing is, you, know, you print up books and you have a stock of books and that's what you do that is what i did yeah the the your unit price is lower but you have to order a bunch of books so it's a matter of finding somewhere that does offset printing more places do it than you might realize so what i did i started looking for print shops and basically that was going online and looking for print shops so i was looking for places in the states because i want to try and keep domestic printing if i could but that is more expensive and you sort of have to balance all that. So I did two print jobs with the first book. The first one was the first chapter I printed on its own. Uh, the idea was I was going yes, for a, yeah. Right. I was going to sell them for a dollar. Nobody buys them for a dollar, so I ended up giving those away as promotional items. So that's that's just money in the in the coffers. But I was able to find. So I live in New York, and I did enough research. I was able to find a print shop in Queens, and I negotiated. I, I asked them how much it would cost to print this thing, and there was no shipping because they just had to drive a van across the bridge. And that made all the difference in the world because paper is heavy and shipping paper is expensive. So I was able to order a bunch of these books, more than I ever need, and there was no shipping on them. So they, end up cost, they ended up costing me something like 65 or 70 cents a copy, which isn't bad. 
Now, that I don't get to sell them for a dollar and make a quarter off each one sucks. But if I'm paying 70 cents to try and promote it anyway. So that was the option. That was the first thing I did. Now, for the printing of the book, they were significantly more expensive because I wanted specific paper. I wanted a, a particular type of product. So I did research on printers. There was a printer in Atlanta I was talking to. I actually visited their press, which was very cool. They showed me around. Well, that's neat. Yeah, it was great. And they showed me the other books and I was looking at, and they gave me paper st- samples and I was like feeling the paper. Like I was really getting involved with like. Yeah, because you wanted to look and feel like the rest of the books that are going to be on a shelf at a comic shop or a Barnes yeah. & Noble or whatever. That was another part of it was I was looking at every book. And at one point I spent three weeks trying to figure out why first seconds books were trimmed at six by eight and a half versus six by nine. Like I was obsessed. Like why are they doing this? What's the research that they have that determined that that was the book size that was best and that was a bit of a pain to get answers because i don't know anybody at first second so i was asking people to ask people relying on other people is challenging eventually but on the other hand uh, people i know at image comics work with printers everywhere and they put me in touch with a printer in south korea and they were great and they were very receptive and that's actually where i got the book printed because the price i mean couldn't beat it it was it was tremendous even with shipping it ended up being cheaper than a domestic. Now, I'm going to do it again with the second book. I'm going to shop around and see where I can go. Some of that is determined by how many copies you're getting printed, how many pages, if you're printing on the inside covers. There's a lot of what paper stock you choose, all that stuff. So really, it's, it's just a lot of research and getting it and learning how it all works and knowing where you go and knowing how to set up a file. And luckily, I have friends that help me set the files up. You, know, you, take your, you take your art and you put it in with your lettering and you put it into InDesign and you build this PDF and you send that and you get a proof. And right. So that's the production side. And then the distribution side is the biggest headache of them all. I can imagine. So, I mean, if you want to say like, so how yeah. many of the volume one of picks, how many did you order? 1,500. 1,500, okay. Yeah. And they all come at once? Or yeah. How, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this it was slightly tricky, which was, so... My publishing company is called Hatter Entertainment. There's a comic book called Hatter M. Oh, yeah, yes. Right, yeah. I remember. This has caused a little bit of confusion in the world because I think the print, the company that printed my book also prints this Hatter M stuff and they got their wires crossed. So I was supposed to get my book by Baltimore Comic Con and I was checking in and they're like, oh, that book is going out next week. I'm like, no, no, you said I was going to have it by this weekend. They're like, oh, no, we made a mistake. We got it confused with the Hatter M thing. I'm like, well, he goes, and, and this, good on them. They shipped me two boxes overseas, like air from Korea, to New- and they paid for the shipping on two boxes of books, which, good on them. And I had books for Baltimore, and I was able to debut the book at Baltimore in 2014. Uh, 14? Yeah. And that was before I had Diamond Distribution. So I was in Baltimore with the book, and I was able to show it to a diamond rep who I'd been in touch with, but I was actually able to physically show them the book and they could see that it was of professional quality. And then I was able to talk to them about how do I get diamond to distribute this book? Because in comics, that's who you have to go through. Yeah, they, they are the distributor. They are the distributor. For better or worse. <laughs> For better or worse. And the lesson I got out of diamond was, A, it's about having a book that is of professional quality and looks legitimate, that they feel like will sell. And B, they want to know that you're not relying completely on Diamond to sell the book, which is to say they want to know you have some sort of marketing and promotion strategy. So my actual pitch to Diamond, and this for anybody self-publishing, this is something to pay attention this to. Is, I, this is fascinating. Sure. My, my document to Diamond was, here's a PDF, Here's the first 50 pages, of the, or I think it was the first 20 pages of the book, is what it looks like. I can send a PDF of the entire book if you want to see it. Here is what I plan to do in terms of marketing and promotions. I do a podcast. I will be talking about the book there. I have ins with uh, these particular stores that have already said they will be ordering copies. I'm going to attempt to be on these podcasts. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to be reaching out. I'm going to be calling stores. Like I basically told them what I'm planning to do. Now, not all that meted out to mean everybody was ordering books, but I think it was enough to communicate to the people at Diamond that, okay, this guy's not going to sit here and be like, hey, Diamond, how come you didn't sell my book? Right. Diamond, that's not what Diamond does. You can pay for somebody at Diamond to hand sell your book. Like there, when So when you put a book in, in previews, the listing is free. If they accept you, your listing is free. Okay. If you want, it's almost like in-app purchases. 
So you can <laughs> you can okay. you can put your you put your thing in there. If you want to get like a spotlight on, pay a little more. If you want a half page ad, you pay a little more. Boom 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 boom. If you want one of the diamond sales team who's like going to store by store to talk about your book specifically, you put a little like there are ways to do that. I'm on a str- shoestring budget. So I happened to luck out that the month my book was solicited was a was a month that the theme of the of that issue of Diamond or of previews was unsung heroes or something, or ki- it was kids. It was either kids comics or unsung heroes. So I got a boost. Yeah, that's very fortuitous. Yeah, and then the guy, my Diamond rep, liked the book enough that he gave it a spotlight. Oh, okay. So that month it got a little extra attention by complete uh, luck of the draw. I don't know if that. I mean, I don't know if that meant more orders. The hmm. initial order was low. It was lower than I was hoping. Uh, now, just coming back to yeah. again that submission process to get it listed. I mean, not to get too in the weeds here, no, but it's fine. what? I mean, is there something on their website? Do you just send it? To it's them all on the website. Oh, okay. There's, yeah. so there is like an actual process. There's gotcha. a whole explanation of how you do it, who you email. How it's long all. did it take to get the approval? It didn't take the approval. Didn't take as long as then. There's just the process of. There's a, a solicitation comes out two months before the book comes out. So I'm approaching Diamond in September and October of 2015. They come back and say, we'll put it in the December catalog for February release. And I'm just like crushed. I'm like, what? And you have the books at this point? I got all yeah. 1,500 just sitting there. And I'm like, oh, no. What? Huh. But that's that's how you, you, know, you, yeah. you play with the card you're given. And then it gave me time to write the solicit and make sure in the, you know, there's a limited number of words you can have in your solicit and it has to be tight and it has to, you know, hit the marks. So, you know, there is that aspect to it. There's just, then there's that tail. But on the other, on the other hand, I was able to then spend November, and December reaching out to comic stores, letting them know the book was there, please order it, which it's December. Nobody was doing it. It was, it was timing wasn't great. On the other hand, I went to, I was in Chicago over Thanksgiving and I went to Challengers Comics in Chicago when the book was solicited. And this was so gr- freaking gratifying. I walked in and I talked to one of the guys. And I'm like, yeah, I've got a book in previews right now. And I want to talk to him. Oh, what page is it on? He goes to the page and he already had it circled. Nice. Like, yes. Yes. So I hope it's done well for them. I don't know. There's no, that's the other thing. If you're not a premier publisher, you don't get to know. Like, you just know what the order is. You don't know where they went. Gotcha. Okay. I don't know what stores ordered which. I don't know how that breaks down. So there's a lot of information I don't have because I'm a tiny, 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 small fish. And so it's it's listed the one time, right? Yeah. And that's it. Okay. Yeah, I've asked about getting it relisted just to, like, get... The, it's on the back list, so people can order it now to this day. Like, I've got the diamond code, and you can just go... If you go to your store now and say, order this book, it'll be in their computer, and they can order it. Oh, I remember looking up stuff all the time at Alternate Realities. Yeah. So I mean, in that code yep. exactly. So it's all there. It's in the it's in their star system. It's in their back stock. When they run out, they order more from me. I send them a box. So please do. I haven't gotten an invoice of a PO in a while. So yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So th- what is the process of getting the the books to Diamond? Like it's just they tell you this is how many we need, and you send them. Yeah. And- so when you first sign up, you can choose. There's a bunch of cra- like a bunch of parameters. Like you can say, only send me an invoice or only send me a PO when you are going to fill a box. So my boxes have 40 copies each. I said, when you have an order, just send it to me. If it's 20 books, I'll send you 20 books. So you basically, the diamond, the solicit goes out. You get your initial order, which is going to be your biggest order, unless something happens. Right, right. Yeah. So I got my initial order. I set up my account with UPS. You ship the books to their center in Missouri. I think it's in Missouri. And you're paying shipping? I'm paying shipping. So, you know, after that first... After that first shipment, I ended up getting preferred rates with UPS, which is great. But it was after the like it would have really helped on that first shipment. So I ship the books, and there's a whole process where you have to put a packing slip inside the boxes. You have to label the boxes. Every label, every box has to have a label with the purchase order, how many boxes are in that shipment. It's, it's you know, it's real legit. I don't know if the boxes get lost once they get there. I don't. That's Diamond's process. But for me, it's setting up these boxes putting the labels on them, getting the UPS shipping labels, sticking them on all the boxes, and they're off. And I think you have something like, you get the order, and you have 30 days to fulfill the order, and then you have to send in an invoice, and then 30 days later you get a check. So everything's, it's a whole thing. So now, that was the initial order. 
And then whenever I get a reorder, I'll get an email with a PO on it, purchase order, telling me how many books they want, where to ship them. And then I do that process again. It tends to be a box or 32 copies. So I have to take eight copies out and put padding in the box and reseal it and then right. put those books somewhere else until, or well, take those to a convention or whatever. Well, yeah, I mean, in theory, I would imagine stores that ordered it initially, if it's done well for them and it's sold, they want to keep it in stock. So I would, then they're reordering hopefully. it. Hopefully. I mean, it, I, I always wonder. I wonder if the stores just say, oh, let's get more because they sold out, or if they think, well, we got rid of those. Whew. I mean... Our work is done. <laughs> speaking from the experience of working at a store for a while, I mean, for us, it would depend. If it was something that, yeah, took a really long time to sell, yeah, it would often be like, okay, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're happy that we sold that and that's it. But, you know, if there's been enough interest, and especially if someone comes in and asks about it, you know, then that's an easy that, reorder. And that becomes the trick of any self-published thing. Like, it could take a long time to sell because nobody's pointing it out. It's just sitting on a shelf. If somebody's actively selling it, you could probably sell a lot of them. If you're like, oh, this is, if you like Lumberjanes, you should read this. If you like Squirrel Girl, you should read this. You might be able to create an interest. I don't know how many stores are doing that. I think, I, I thought about this recently, which is, I think there's a clear benefit to a store to sell somebody on Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur because there's going to be another issue next month and you can keep that machine going. And they're probably making more money per single $4 comic than they are selling my single issue book or single volume book. So it's tricky. I get it. I get frustrated when I see stores tweeting or putting on Facebook like, oh, this, you know, a family of, of with three girls came in and I sold them copies of this, this, and this. And I'm like, my book isn't there. My book will never be there. It's, you know, that's my own, it's frustrating for anybody doing independent stuff. It's not just me. I've had the conversation with other people. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a tough, you know, mountain to climb, I, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, I mean, what, you don't have to give me specifics, but like what sort of cut does Diamond take? Diamond takes for, I, I mean, again, the exclusives probably get, you know, Marvel, DC, Dark Horse. I, they probably have a different strategy, but. Diamond pays you 40% of your cover price. Okay. And then they, so they get a 60% discount and then they sell it to the stores for whatever the, whatever they have arranged with that. I think different stores have different discounts. Yeah. Depending rates. on how much you order that yeah. affects your discount rate. But Diamond's general, they buy from you at 40% of cover. So that's something to consider when, and it's something I'm considering with the next book is figuring out what my unit cost is, what they'll be paying for it. And so I, I probably did it wrong the first time. Okay. So get the book now because the price is going to go up if I go back to print. <laughs> if I go back to press for a second print, which I hope to do, the price is going up. Right. You've heard it here first. Yeah, there you go. And so now it's, your book is not just available through Diamond. You also have it is it on your website and Amazon. Yes. And I think you, you probably could order it at a bookstore because if you just give them the ISBN number, they can get it. It is not... Okay, so this gets... This is some more in the weeds, complicated stuff. So there are two diamond distribution organizations there's diamond comic books or Di diamond comics distributors dcd and then there's diamond book distributors dbd those are two separate entities diamond comics distributors sells in the direct market to comic book stores that's comics trade paperbacks diamond direct all that stuff diamond book distributors sells to the book market book market is amazon barnes and noble what was once Borders, Books a Million, all those things. Schools, libraries, that's Diamond Books. Two separate agencies entirely. So to get my books on Amazon, to get my books to schools and libraries, I went through Diamond Books. And that took some convincing as well, which is basically, I had to basically tell them, yeah, yeah, don't worry about Barnes & Noble. Don't worry about big box retailers. I want to sell specifically to schools, libraries, and on Amazon. And the reason why they went with that is returnability so in the comic book market in the direct market books are non-returnable unless the publisher says this right you know, first issues of of rebirth are returnable in general if a comic store buys a book they own that book and it's theirs forever to do with what they will if barnes and noble buys a book and they haven't sold it in six months they just send it back we couldn't sell it and it could be damaged it could have been read in the store a hundred times and then that all gets tracked back to the publisher and there's returnability fees there's all that stuff. So for a small publisher like myself, it was suggested that try and limit your returnability as much as possible. 
So that is why the book is not in Barnes. You can't just go into a Barnes & Noble. It's not going to be on the shelf. Right. Unless I've gone in and just put it on the shelf, which I have not done, but I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's it's there's a UPC. It's a legit thing. If you punch in the UPC code, you could probably order it. If you go into Barnes & Noble and say, can you order me this book? But if you do that, pay for it because then... Or just get it on Amazon. They're there. So, Am- so, but, so like you were saying, the Amazon thing is also through the Diamond Book Distributor. Because yes. so, you can, like anybody can sell can set themselves up as a seller. Yeah, and I thought about doing that. I thought about that, doing it on my own, but then I thought, well, the whole point of going through Diamond is to go through Diamond. So yeah. I let them handle the Amazon stuff. It get a little complicated because I had to make sure the details of the book were correct. And I'm like, oh, can you change the summary? Can you put these pull quotes in? It's a process. So I would imagine a huge piece of this is getting the word out. It's It's trying to get as much coverage as possible anywhere I can. And sometimes you hit good results. Sometimes you don't. I reached out to the Valkyries because they're on the front lines and they're a bunch of ladies selling comics. And some Valkyries have been very responsive and some have been less so. So you you can't paint with a broad brush. Some stores have been very responsive. Some you never hear from again. I went to, I was in California, Los Angeles, where there's a bunch of comic stores. I was walking around going store by store. And in some stores, it seemed like they couldn't be bothered to even look at, you know, can I show you the book? Well, I don't know what the books. I'm like, can I show it to you? And you can ch- tell your, yeah, it really wouldn't help. Okay, I'm going to leave now. And then there was another store I went into. Oh, God, now I feel like I can't remember. There were two stores. One was called Blast Off Comics. That guy was great. And I think House of Secrets was the other one. These were in Burbank. And the guy at House of Secrets bought the book for me right there. He's like, are you selling that one? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. And then the other guy, Blast Off, I was talking to him for a while. And he brought up the diamond... And he's like, do you know how many they have? I'm like, no, he tells me the number. And he goes, well, they have one less. And he bought one right there. I'm like, this is awesome. This guy's great. Uh, the folks at Meltdown had a copy there. It was very exciting. I got to sign it. Uh, a guy at Golden Apple said he would tell, like he was really nice. And he's like, I'll tell them that you stopped by. Thank you. I left a copy of the first chapter. So it really, it's like store by, it's so, it's so hard to do. Store yeah, by store is impossible. Like yeah. Getting people to spread the word is hard. I don't know. I don't have the answers. I Are wish you doing I did. it again? I'm doing it again. I don't know what I'm thinking. Now, have you... I'm thinking the second book will help the first book. Have you done or thought about doing crowdfunding? I thought about it. I'm, I'm thinking about it for the second book. That becomes another social media thing. But I've thought about it. I'm trying to think of ways to make it where... I look at other crowdfunding things and, I'm, and I think like, how would I... Like, I don't know about that. So I'm trying to think of a way to make it work. I'm trying to think of a way that it would A, help me raise money to help pay for the second book and then maybe take care of some of the stock of the book I have to get closer to doing a second printing of the first book. Right. So we'll see. Yeah. it's. I mean, I bring that up for a couple of reasons. One, I know you mentioned uh, Devil Dinosaur and Moon Girl. Yeah. Right. And that's co-written by Brandon Montclair, yeah. who former owner of Alternate Realities. He was very on the show. Deep, very deep, sonorous voice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he was on the show last year. That was a good episode. Yeah, a lot of people seem to like that one. Uh, yeah, he had a lot of, a lot of uh, very interesting insight into, you know, because he was an assistant editor and he's done independent comics. He's written for the big two. So, you know, he has a lot of different perspectives. And, you know, he and Amy Reader, they do their Rocket Girl series and they d- did a Kickstarter for that initially and that mm-hmm. was published by Image and, you know, they've had success with that. And at Comic-Con, I covered the Kickstarter panel. It was Secrets of Kickstarter Revealed. Oh, uh, and please. I covered that for Bleeding Cool. By all means. No real secrets, but it was interesting. I mean, they had a few Is people. Is the secret work really hard? It's yeah. going to be another job? Well, you know, it's funny. So the panel was moderated by someone who works at Kickstarter. And in fairness, he kicked it off by saying, like, you know, nothing here is really a secret. But one thing that he brought up is how to have your project selected as a staff pick. Mm. I don't think they actually call it that, but uh, something akin to that. Uh, so your project is really, you know, highlighted on the site. And the, <laughs> the advice given was basically, not basically, literally, have a great project, which it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but it was, it was an interesting panel and there were people up there who have run successful Kickstarter campaigns. And it being that it was at Comic-Con, it was actually specifically geared for aspiring independent comic book creators and apparently comic book projects do have a higher success rate than projects generally there. And that most of the successful ones raise between one and $10,000. Sounds about right. So I guess if you, yeah, you know, if you have the right target 
and the rest of your Kickstarter is great. <laughs> well, I know that I know the video, you know, making a, a good video is important. Not asking for too much is important. Yeah, having a very clear idea to convey to the potential backers of yeah. what the project is. Being very clear of what you're asking for. You know, I've seen people raise over 70 grand for a project and I'm just like, damn. And then I've seen people struggle to raise five. And I in I have my moments where I'm like, I could I could raise I could raise three. I must be able to raise three. And then I think, I don't know if I can raise three. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know. I don't there's a lot of psychology in it. And like convincing people to give you money. It's weird, man. Yeah. No, it's I mean I've really been giving this a lot of thought because I for whatever that next project is, I mean I want to get new equipment and things like that. And, you know, there might be travel involved. I mean, I just, you know, so I don't want to do it the same way that I did with the previous ones where it was all out of pocket. The confidence comes and goes because sometimes I'm like, well, you know, I have these other documentaries that are out there. There's been a very favorable response to them. I do this podcast. I get X number of hits on that. It's like, I think I could raise it. But then again, it's like, I don't, I really don't know. When push comes to shove and you're asking people for money, like it's a really, it's very tricky. It comes down to collecting and what we should have been doing instead of collecting pop vinyls or whatever the hell I buy. We should be collecting followers in social media <laughs> and then we can bank on them to give us all a dollar or so whatever it is. Nobody yeah. gives a dollar. <laughs> but there's a, a former Alternate Realities customer who is also an independent comic book creator. He recently launched a Kickstarter for, for his project and he was looking for, I believe, around 18000 and the Kickstarter was not successful. That's a lot of money. And, you know, yeah, it's, I mean, I contributed to it. I was excited for him and, you know, unfortunately it didn't work out. I think he's planning to relaunch down the line i would assume and hope with you know a different target in mind um but yeah i mean it's you know it's a tough thing and when you see something like that you know it, it can be a little discouraging but oh and then you see people that ask for five and make 25 and you're like oh my god that's amazing like that doesn't happen that that's that's maybe a fluke who knows i don't know I w- it would be very it would be very gratifying to ask for two and make ten. Of course, that would be amazing. I have no I have no idea. Every time I think about it, I get antsy. Yeah. Every time I, I I try and figure out like the a foolproof system, I'm like I don't nothing's fool. Like, come on, it's tough. And I think about it too. It's like let's say I do it for a documentary, and one of the rewards is you know you get the documentary, yeah. which is a very reasonable. Like if I were backing the project, I would it expect sounds to get it. Sensible, yeah. But then I'm worried. It's like, is there enough of an audience for this thing where I have enough people who are going to contribute to a Kickstarter and then not pay for the finished product and enough people out there who, you know, who are not involved with the Kickstarter who would buy it? Yeah, I think that's a case of, well, I I, I was talking to when I was at Baltimore, I was talking to the Diamond rep about Kickstarter. That was actually something he brought up. It's like people show up at Diamond with a book they Kickstarted thinking, look, we successfully Kickstarted it. But in some ways that says, You've sold it to everybody that's going to want it. Exactly. Yeah. So that's a fear of yeah. mine. <laughs> no, look, I think about it with, with my book. There's a part of me that thinks maybe I should be taking this book to publishers and seeing if they want to pick it up. Just one book is done. One book yeah. is on the way. And I thought about that on and off. And then I've heard people say, you could do that, but you've already printed the book and it's only sold X number of copies. So that might tell a publisher that that's the limit of its... Which is untrue because I haven't had the power of a publisher promoting it. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's all this. I mean, it's how loud is the megaphone? How much is happening? And can you convince somebody that something is of more value than it's, it's shown evidence to be? I certainly don't know how the film world works, but I have a slightly better understanding of comics. Maybe. One of the languages I'm most at ease with or, at ease, or just most adept or skilled in is making comics. I would love to do storybooks and you know illustrated novels i want to do all as much as i can screenplays i'm less skilled in but i wouldn't say no but basically telling a story making something up and communicating that make them up is what i like to do comics is the thing i do the most it is the most control over the narrative yes especially in your case where you're self-publishing it so you write everything you know you i write it i letter it I pencil it, I ink it, I color it, I pu- I print it. I, I don't. Pr- I publish it. Somebody else prints it. I don't have a press. That would be extreme. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, e- which which has yeah, its that'd own- be pretty hardcore if you which, were printing it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> which has its own hiccups because I think there's there's a there's a 
bias is the wrong word, but there's definitely a, an impression of what self-published means. I think that a lot of people see self-published as, oh, a regular publisher wouldn't publish it, which is not necessarily the case. This is a case of me saying, I want to self-publish this for all kinds of reasons. One is a bit of lack of patience. And two is, I mean, not every publisher. I have, I pitched it back in 2007 and it didn't, it didn't fly because at the time a comic book a superhero comic starring a female teenager was dead in the water like now is the time where that happens and even now there's two this there's more this comp there's more competition how am i going to sell my book when they're selling dc superhero girls that has everybody they recognize it's hard side note how is it being being on the not only are on the other talking about being on the other side of the art table but the other side of the podcast table you host your own podcast i do and now you're a guest. i usually do the interviewing i i at the risk of sounding like a a weird egotist. I like it. I like being asked questions. I rarely get asked questions. Right, right. That's the thing. Yeah, I actually like when I'm doing <laughs> when I'm doing stuff said, and the guest flips on me and asks me a question. I love it. But yeah, it's funny. I know, despite hosting the show, and even if it feels like you're doing a lot of the talking, it's you know, it's definitely a different, you know, different dynamic. And you're when you're asking the questions. Well, when you're asking the questions, you are in search of something, right? You're trying to find something, and you're and you're paying attention to the answer, and you're seeing where the holes are, and where you can come back and. You know, like like it's almost like Rocky in a fight. You're looking for your in. You're looking for when you're going to throw that, you know. A Rocky analogy? Yeah. Uh, Special for you. You know what show you're on. Yeah. So now it's like uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have to be looking for those pockets. I just get to wait and see what, what kind of punches you want me to throw. And I'll just throw them. I don't have to worry so much about, you know, getting that uppercut. Yeah. Getting the knockout blow. That's your job now. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm, I'm just keeping my defenses low. Yeah. Well, if you get knocked down, all that matters is that you get back up. That's what Chumbawamba said. That Yes. <laughs> As referenced in the, the lone blooper on Wacky Man, The Rise I, of a Puppeteer. I put blooper in quotes on that one. Yeah. No, not a, not a blooper. Just a fun bit of business. Yeah. It's Zach being fun. So where does your admiration for those superpowers say? Well, the, f- flip the, first, the conversation on you. Yeah. No. I mean, the first Superman anything that I That's got right. was, was, that, that, was that, that one. So I was telling you before we recorded that I, I can remember li- literally when I saw them for the first time. So I was a kid. I was born in 1975. Everybody could do the math. And I grew up with Mego figures, which were awesome. And I can specifically remember a birthday cake with a Batman and Robin Mego on the cake. Because I was into superheroes pretty early on. Spider-Man, Mego, all of them. I had a bunch of them. And then they went away. And I'm a little kid. I don't know that they're not making them anymore. They're just They weren't superhero toys in the toy store anymore. I was getting G.I. Joe's and Star Wars still. And I, I can remember going... Lionel Playworld was the toy store we went to. And I remember turning the corner where the action figures were. And there was a wall of them. These superhero toys. Just a, like they were everywhere. And I was just like, oh my God, these toys are back. I didn't know it was a new thing. I was just like, the superhero toys are back. And it's just, this is the greatest. It was amazing. And they did not have a Batman because I would have gotten Batman. But the first ones I bought were Flash and Green Lantern. And God damn it, I played with those... Nice. Like incessantly. And I can remember finding a Hawkman because that was a hard one. Hawkman was tough. And I found a Hawkman. It was huge. The wings and everything. It's just, I had, the only one I never had was Wonder Woman. And then my stepbrother, he's five years younger than me. So wait, what year were you born, you said? 87. <sighs> yeah, he was born 81. So he was around. So he had like a Martian Manhunter. He had the mail order Clark Kent. Uh, you know, I've been so tempted to get that on eBay. It's a great figure. I know. I prob- I'll probably get it. I think he had a Wonder Woman. So at some point, I think we had everything. We didn't have some like, we didn't have Samurai and Apache. Like those, you couldn't find them. But the Red Tornado was cool. Like it was just all these awesome superheroes that I knew from Challenge of the Super Friends yeah. and some comic books. And they're the best. It's an amazing line. I mean, even today they hold up. The sculpts are great. They look awesome. Did you have the play sets or so, the vehicles? Okay. So let me try. I had the, okay. A little mini tragic story that's going to fit. I had the Batmobile. Batmobile is the best. Have you seen the Batmobile? From Superfront? From yeah. Superpowers? Yeah. No, I don't okay. think so. Batmobile is about this big. So, what was that, like 14 inches long? Yeah. It was, and it had buttons and stuff that you'd push. So, the headlights would come up. The little bat eyes on the front would come up. You'd push a button and the bumper would bump out forward. You hit another button on the back and this claw would open out in the back and grab bad guys. It was sweet. So, years ago, I used to have all my comics... So I grew up in Miami. All my comics were in storage in Florida. My toys were in there too. 
So it's a box of Star Wars stuff, a box of a bag of G.I. Joe's, superpowers, all that stuff. I went home one year for Thanksgiving and I went to check on the storage like I used to do and uh, gone. No. Yeah, the lock was changed and I'm like, what happened here? And they cut the lock and all the comics and the toys were gone. Oh, man. Brutal. What it's happened? like 23 long boxes. My theory is I had gone in there and, I, and the, the storage I was in had some water leaking. So I'm like, I need to move my storage. So they gave me another locker and I think whoever it was saw what was moving. So I can only suspect they went in, cut the lock and put a new one. And took, oh, but they didn't take everything, just awful. the comics and the toys. Brutal. I know. That is, I mean, we didn't get into it and we won't, we don't have to belabor the whole thing, but I, I talked to you of like, I'm a bit of a laps collector. Yeah. That was the, that was the second straw. The first straw was, I was working at Marvel and we'd get comp books. Like you get bundles from Marvel and DC of everything. And I just had comics everywhere. And I remember specifically, there was just a comic on my phone. I slipped on it. The cover just ripped off and I didn't even look to see what it was. I'm like, whatever. And that's when I knew, I'm like, I don't, I wasn't bagging and boarding anymore. I wasn't keeping records. I used to keep records of what I had. Oh, like that's you, what this, that's wow. what this folder is. <laughs> is all my lists of the books I had. In the grand tradition of many My Comic Shop History guests, you came, you came prepared yeah. with the folder. Phil, Phil Hussein would be proud. Look at this. This is, these are the books I was buying in college. I'd write down what I had to oh, keep man. a list. Yeah. This came in very handy though, when I had to fill out my insurance claim. On what was missing. Yeah, it's a good thing you cataloged I a, everything. I had a record. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Man. Well, I can understand why you would be a lapsed collector. I mean, <laughs> having having you know, your your toys and everything stolen, I would imagine is very traumatic and it's just the value of them, you realize it's all sentimental. Because I didn't sell any of them. There was no so then you're just like, all right, well those those are gone. I can go on the internet and look at pictures of Star Wars figures and kind of remember yeah, it's funny. I mean, I got rid of all of my, like all the action figures that I played with as a kid. I got rid of them through tag sales. And I remember bringing a bunch to alternate realities and we just put them out in a box for like a dollar each. Part of me is like, oh, it would have been nice to have them and look at them every now and then. But I feel like it's the sort of thing, if I had them, I wouldn't look at them. Yes. And it's only that I don't have them that it's like, oh, it'd be nice if I could look at them. Sure. So I think I'm sentimental for the time. Yes. You know, but not so much the actual item. Nostalgia is a is a powerful and potent and dangerous thing, man, because you can you can really get trapped in it and sort of follow like I can look at these lists of books and this takes me back. Like I can remember in college going to the comic store with my friends. We had a ritual. Wednesdays we'd go to the store, pick up our books, go to a place called Heavenly Ham, get ham sandwiches. They were so good. And then we'd each go to our separate apartments and you'd you'd organize your books in the order you wanted to read them. At that point, I put the stuff I really want to read at the bottom, and I would read the books. And it was that was Wednesdays, man. And they were the and you you'd parse them out so that by you get them all read by next Wednesday, and you pick up your next stack of books. And that you know I can think about that without actually having the books in front of me, and that's pretty good. Uh, but that well, that's too bad about the superpowers figures. But it's cool that you you know collected them and you I mean like did you play with them or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no no that, I mean I wasn't I was buying them and playing with them yeah, that's what as I, you should and and those ended up I've talked about this in another podcast I was on where all my GI Joes became superheroes so it all became a big mishmash of everything. In fact, the Martian Manhunter figure I used to use yeah the Martian Manhunter figure became a different character that would, a GI Joe figure would turn into that one. It's a whole. Thing. I created whole universes in my head. Yeah, I mean, characters. do you feel like that was the beginnings of your? Of course, you, know, you as a All storyteller. It I yeah. mean, it, it starts. You know, I was a little kid, and I was. I loved superheroes, and I liked drawing. And then you start making like single comic strips when you're seven or eight years old, and you're drawing this stuff. I still have my earliest stuff. I think I was, I was probably six or seven. It's like a one-page comic of Bubble Man. And then in fifth grade, I did a, I had a character called Rescue, a speedster. That was based on the GI Joe figure. First Aid. I think his name was First Aid. <laughs> I can't remember. He wore like, it was red and white. He was like the, the First Aid outfit. Anyway. Yeah, that was all my, it was all just born out of playing, which is funny because now I have this idea of writing a story where we just play and make the story out of it. Yeah. So yeah, I would just play. I mean, I probably played with toys for much longer than anybody was supposed to. I like how old? I feel like certainly into my early teens, hmm. like 13. I don't, I mean... My bar mitzvah theme was superheroes. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you might have me beat by a little bit, but not by much. I mean, I feel like I was still definitely like towards the end of elementary school. So seventh day, I mean like, yeah, 12, 13. Yeah. You know, I was still, you know, playing with the toys. The, <laughs> we t- I talked about this in the live episode, but I think I cut it. 
the superpowers Superman figure, what I did to that poor figure. I mean, so it was, you know, banged up a little bit as, you know, a, a lot of them were, but, and this was when I was very little, for whatever reason, I decided, <laughs> decided that I wanted to repaint the figure mm. and my grandfather did it. Red shirt, black pants. Why not? I, I, I don't. And I don't, I don't know. I like red shirt day, obliterating the S or? Yeah. Really? I don't know why. It huh. wasn't even like I was trying to dress him in a suit. Like, oh, it's Clark I think Kent. This, I think this explains the Smallville thing. Maybe, yeah, the like, red like, shirt. Like, put him in regular clothes. Yeah. That's my, I prefer my <laughs> Superman dress like just a regular dude. Yeah, no flights, no tights. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> so, but, you know, obviously I ended up getting a, um, you know, I got it on eBay, the, you know, the original one. Still in its, in its packaging. And at Comic Con, I picked up uh, Lex Luthor, loose. Yeah, that's a great. That's a great figure. But, yeah, my favorite. Yeah. The Flash was amazing. Green Lantern yes. was amazing. Batman was a good figure, but the 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 Green Lantern one was so good. It was. I was telling you beforehand. You know, yeah, you they had it. a number of them there. They had the Green Lantern, but without the lantern. Right. And I was like, no. I mean, in retrospect, it's like, what? I should have just gotten it. But and that wasn't too expensive because he didn't have the lantern. <laughs> They, they had Batman too, but that was about 55. Yeah. And again, it wasn't in the packaging. And I was like, that's that's too much for this. Also, something I'm very impressed with about those figures and something that I don't like about modern figures is I know I know people like the articulation because they can pose them and stuff, but they look ugly. They start looking ugly. Yeah. The superpowers figures are articulated at the knees and the hips. That's it. And the, and the elbows and the shoulders, I mean. Now, granted, G.I. Joe figures were way more playable. You could do because they had that arm twist which was awesome. But I think they've, they've gone overboard with those articulation, guys. Slow it down. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm always tempted to get more and more of these superpowers figures. Again, so far, I've, I've limited myself to the Superman and the Lex. Part of me is like, to, you know, to what end? I mean, would it, I don't know, would I enjoy the hunt? Would I like looking at them after? Or is it just like I have this, this bug and then I'd get them and it would just so I drew, lose interest? I did my first uh, paying comic work in 1997. Which is when Mar when when Star Wars were releasing re releasing all their figures or re you know, doing the new versions of everything, and they were putting out a version of the Millennium Falcon, a toy I could never have as a kid because it was too expensive. It was like thirty dollars when I was a kid. It was well, all for one oh, toy, no, look, yeah. it couldn't it couldn't happen. But now I got a check for drawing What If number one hundred four, and there was a new version of the Falcon out. So I used I paid fifty bucks for it, <laughs> and I bought myself. I finally got the Millennium Falcon. That, I think, was not taken out of the storage. So I have this re-release version of the Falcon sitting in a box somewhere in Miami. But, you know, I, I got to fill that hole. It's fine. But I've never, as much as I think about buying, like, Amigo Batman, because that was my one of my favorite toys ever, I've never been able to justify spending the money on Amigo. Not even the re-release versions. So I'm like, what am I going to do with it? My grandfather used to say, I remember walking with him through Epcot Center once, me and my little brother walking around the gift shop. Ooh, I want that. And he'd be like, for what purpose? For what purpose? <laughs> and I, you know, at the time, it, but now I ask myself, that, like, for what? what, Why? Why would I buy that? What am I going to do with it? And that's why I don't have as much stuff as I used to. I've got some, like, mini busts still in the boxes sitting there. I could probably sell this stuff on eBay. I just haven't done any of it. I'm the worst. I'm a bad collector. <laughs> I used to be good. Now I'm bad. No, that's, I, I, you know, I've seen this in myself. I've seen this in people I've spoken to, people I've spoken to on the show. It's, I think it's a very difficult thing to maintain but you guys over all, decades. But you guys all seem to find a rebirth in it. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. How long have we been? We've been going a long time. Yeah, so we've been recording for two hours and 40 minutes. Jesus. <laughs> that's too much. What was that I was saying about not editing these episodes? Yeah, you're going to have to. <laughs> Do something. I'm I'm sorry to everybody. This was. I mean, honestly, like especially all the stuff about self-publishing a comic. I mean, I find that interesting, and I imagine comic book fans listening to this would find it interesting to get that insight into the process. I, I hope so. Yeah, but I, I can imagine somebody saying, "Who is this idiot? I've never even heard of this guy, and he's talking like he knows something." You know, plenty, and maybe now people will check out. Listen, for anyone listening to this, this I, is here's what this is. I'm now verbalizing. The, maybe I can raise three thousand. I can't raise three thousand. This is an, a manifestation of it, right? Yeah, talking like I, talking because I do know things, and then saying nobody's going to think I know anything, even though I just talked a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I got problems. <laughs> <laughs> but for anybody listening to this, I highly encourage you check out 
stuff said, check out Cruising Together. Pick up Picks Volume 1. Keep an eye out for Picks Volume 2. If you were annoyed by any of this, you will hate Cruising Together, <laughs> which is all nonsense. I think it's funny. Yeah. But, you know, it's not for everybody. I, I sh- I'm going to stop talking. I was inspired by you. I, I briefly toyed with the idea of doing, like, the Stallone version of that. But, A, it's been done. It has? It ha- yeah, there's okay. a, a podcast out there. I was curious. I'm like, oh, I wonder if anyone's done something like this. And they had. But I don't know. If you do it, I'll do Copland. Okay. Well, Greg, thank you very much for being part of this episode. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you to everyone for listening. Don't be a flat squirrel. Next time on My Comic Shop History, I met your doppelganger, a younger doppelganger, at San Diego Comic-Con. His name is Ben Cito. Great guy. Bears an uncanny resemblance to you. At least I think so. What was your reaction when you saw that photo? Well, I was shocked. I was I was actually out to dinner with uh, with my wife and a friend of a friend of mine from elementary school. And I looked at it, and I guess it took a second because I thought, "How did it, it was a photo of myself?" <laughs> um, I, I I actually love the uh, the the. Well, I guess your what is it, the post descriptions or yeah. So I I I can't put into words how excited I was. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, I, I always put up a caption with whatever photo I'm posting, and I really, I truly couldn't decide on one, so I put up four. And uh, one of them was basically suggesting that he was your love child. Oh, from the, yeah, because... Uh, yeah, like, did you ever spend any time... He's from San Francisco. It's like, did you ever spend any time on the West Coast in the 80s? <laughs> well, after... When was it? I guess it was after... It must have been after law school. Graduated in 81. I spent 81 to 82 in Japan. And then on my way back, I stopped in um, in California before coming back to New York because my roommate from Yale was a medical student at the uh, the Stanford. So uh, I got in and we were going to go out, but uh, but the jet lag knocked me out and I was unconscious for the whole night. As far as you so know, any, yeah, anything could have happened. Anything <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. So uh, I think it might be this kid's father. Steve. <laughs> Uh, that he was, was, uh, he was in the area <laughs> during the time in question, no and he has a period of time that he can't account for. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah, but uh, so if, if you if you were at Comic Con or if you otherwise ran into this young man, I what, hope you would have walked around with him for a while. <laughs> yeah, like what would you, what would you like? What would you? Yeah, would you do something like that? Would you try to impart advice? Would you consider him a younger version of yourself? No, I guess the the first thought that came to my mind was I could commit a crime and disappear. And then they would just grab this guy and put him in the lineup, and they would. And it's amazing you go to that. Yeah, that's the spirit. Yeah. 